inspiration behind horror stories, as well as the possibilities that monsters may not be safely locked away in the pages of fiction. We'll also explore cryptids of all varieties, along with sightings, encounters, and reports. Thank you for joining us. Hello, folks, and welcome to DAX Machina on Wednesday. Uh, I'm not sure why there was no video with that. There was supposed to be. It plays on the computer with video. <laughs> so add that to the list of glitches I've got to figure out. Uh, that will uh, that will take care of that sometime in the very near future. Oh, we're already starting to get some uh, get some uh, uh, some comments in the crowd. Um, joining me tonight will be uh, acting as my co-host is Naoma Finn. Everybody, everybody that's familiar with the show should know her. And uh, you know, we'll uh, we're just going to jump right into this. Um, Bobfoot says a little late. I see. Um, oh. Roger Peacock liked the stream. Thank you, Roger. Uh, Georgiana, Georgian Sherman says hi. Um, Bobfoot says, no, Facebook users is looking good, y'all. Uh, Bill Sloan says, no worries. Gives me more time to work on Halloween stuff. Awesome. Appreciate you guys for joining us tonight. Uh, tonight we're gonna we're gonna talk about some of the more famous incidents involving cryptid attacks. Uh, and, and, you know, we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, some of the ones we've already talked about, but I've made a pretty good list of some of the more famous incidents. It's by no, no means an all-inclusive list, uh, but it, it, it does talk about, uh, about some of the, uh, the incidents, and these are all places I would like to go film. Uh, so I think that would be a hell of a lot of fun. What about you, Naoma? Would you, uh, would you want to go film at some of these places? I would. Some of them, not so much, but I, there's some of them I'd really like to go to. I, uh, I wouldn't mind flying over Fort Chatham, Alaska, or Port Chatham, my bad. That would be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. At about 10,000 feet, sure. <laughs> <laughs> See, I actually want to go there. I mean, I would want to be food, uh, feet on the ground. Uh, yeah, too many Georgian people says, get love your Steve Little story. Do what? I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to talk over you. Too many people get tore up there. Yeah, or just disappear. <laughs> mutilated bodies, you know. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, of course, I want to go to LBL, and that's as, just as bad, so. Oh, well, yeah, but it's going to be a lot of fun. Hmm. Right up until yeah. the time we disappear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you know. Yeah, the, right up until the, the screaming starts, it should be a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, giggles, laughs, screams, <laughs> pleads was it a, mercy. Was it a, Jeff blessed. Goldblum said on Jurassic Park, yeah, it starts with the ooze, ooze and the oz, but then there's the screaming and the running. Laura <laughs> yeah. uh, says hello from South Florida. Hey, thank you for joining us. Facebook user, that's Sentinel, by the way. Do I have to sign in or something? I sent him a link to the show. Okay. Um, <laughs> need Cody X gun? Yeah, if you if you need that big mini gun to go to go to Port Chatham. Yeah. Papa said Halloween already. Isn't it a little early? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> it's never too early. Hello from Alabama. Howdy. Thank you for joining us. Love the Steve, Steve Lilly for, story. Looking forward to more. There will definitely be more. Steve, I mean, I'm sorry. Cam is going to be doing a uh, Steve Lilly story that involves some of the some of the crew from the Wild Hunt. And I have another one that I'm going to be doing before too terribly long. Um, I, I did speak to Cam today, and we're not going to be able to do the uh, the stream this weekend like we were planning. So Saturday will be a DAX Machina like normal, uh, but we are planning to do something with with Cam probably sometime in September. He's just booked so solid at work, he doesn't have the time off that he thought he was going to have. So keep an eye on that. That will be happening sometime in the hopefully not so distant future. I have a quick uh, tech question. Shoot. When I put these up on the screen, can you see them? Uh, no, they're not coming through on my side. Hmm. That's interesting. What am I doing wrong? Sal, Kentucky. 
Sal asks, are you selling the Wild Hunt patches yet? I have the designs with a patch company, and I'm waiting to hear back uh, their, uh, how much it's going to cost per unit cost to get them, print, uh, get them uh, printed. But we are in the process of getting those, and I hope I have them before too terribly long. I, I do want to start getting those and having those. I have a, a prototype of the patch. If I can find it, it's up here on my desk somewhere in all this clutter. Uh, the green screen may may green it out because of the color. Yeah, it's a green screening <laughs> it out. <laughs> Put it right That's... in front of your face and see how that looks. There you go, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the green screen's killing it because it's green, but uh, it, unfortunately, I, I, I could probably turn the green screen off and show it to you, but then I may never get the green screen back on. Uh, but those are in the works, so hopefully I'll have those available very soon. Uh, Georgian Sherman says, do we have Bigfoot, Dogman, etc. in Hawaii? Uh, I have not heard of Bigfoot or Dogman in Hawaii, uh, but there is a type of cryptid uh, in Hawaii that's very similar. Um, let me pull up my email on that. Um, I've got the, I've got the list of that. Um, oh, wrong email. I've got so dang many. My bad. Sorry about that. Um, the one in Hawaii, the cryptid in Hawaii is called a, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right. It's called a Minehuni, M-E-N-E-M-E-N-E-H-U-N-E. -E -E. Uh, and it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, and it, you can, you can Google that. Uh, they're, they're smaller, uh, a little more mischievous, uh, but that's at some point I would like to do a do a show on that at well, but as well. But it's called the Minehuni. I and I'm, again I'm guessing M E N E H U N E. So I will put that actually in the chat and see if you guys can pronounce it any better than I can. <laughs> Minehuni. Uh, I have Bob Foots coming up. I kind of have a theory about the 411 cases. It is basically that there is an increase in people in national parks compared to the regular woods. So by default, more people will go missing there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And people are going farther into the backcountry than they used to. Paul, sa Paul Lotsky says, hello from Louisville, Kentucky. Love the show. Thank you very much. And Joseph Fusco says, I loved your code name, Wild Hunt, with Steve Lilly. Great job of blending the two book characters. Excellent story. Loved it. Love Cam, Steve Lilly, too, in his narrations. Cam's awesome. I, I love I love working with him. Naoma's awesome, too. She does some fantastic narrations. She's part from the Dixie, Dixie Cryptid and What If It's True podcast. So you have a part of, a part of that right here tonight. So. Yay. Yeah, she's, <laughs> she's awesome. She's going to be doing the narration for Lakeview Man. I am doing the narration for Lake. Yes, I and mean, I can't wait. <laughs> I didn't. Are you, I, I don't know why it's not not letting me see it when you bring it up. Yeah. Uh, Bob Foot says I kind of have a theory about the four one one cases. Yeah, that's. I agree. I think there's more people going places they didn't used to go. Yeah. Um, Willie Johnson says kind of like the chupacabra here in Texas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that. There's a couple of versions of the chupa, chupacabra. There's the one that seems to be some sort of a dog-like creature. And then there was the one that they found in, in Puerto Rico, which seems to be more lizard-like. Uh, so I, I, I don't know if it's the same creature or people are just describing you know, describing a similar creature. Uh, but the, the one they, they uh, described from Puerto Rico definitely seemed to be, uh, appear more lizard-like, which is really kind of odd. Yeah. The uh, kind of um, the lizard version sort of nullifies the mangy coyote theory. Definitely. Of generation on Dixie. Um, Sorry, I had to get a drink of water. <laughs> that's okay. Um, but it loved your narration on Dixie. Is that to me? Thank you. Yeah, it'd definitely be you because I haven't narrated anything. So, okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. 
Um, I, I, I guess the, the first uh, violent cryptid encounter I want to bring up is probably one of the most famous ones. Uh, and I'm sure Naomi knows quite a bit about this one. It's the Ape Canyon incident from 1924 with Fred Beck and his crew of miners. Um, that uh, is, a, is a really cool story because uh, it happens kind of in the shadows of Mount St. Helens. And uh, if, if you're not familiar with it, we'll just go over it at, at brief. Uh, but basically a group of miners uh, were working a claim near Mount St. Helens in an area known as Ape Canyon. And they started seeing these creatures. Well, a couple of them took shots at them and they even shot one of the creatures. And that night their cabin was attacked. They were throwing like small boulder sized rocks onto the cabin, uh, trying to beat their way through the door. And they were, and the miners inside were like shooting through the cracks and, and, uh, striking at, at, at hands that were coming through holes on the walls and stuff. And they fought them off for the entire night. And when morning came and the creatures disappeared back into the darkness, they grabbed what gear they could carry and bolted for where they had their, their, uh, vehicle part and basically just abandoned the claim. Um, uh, now they left behind a lot of mining equipment and a, and a well-built cabin. Uh, so the, to me, that lends legitimate legitimacy to, to the claim because there, you know, who in the, in, in, like in the, the area, area of time, right before the great depression, who would leave that much equipment laying around? And there are other people that have found the location of the cabin. Of course, you can't find it now because of the, the Mount St. Helens eruption. Uh, but apparently before Mount St. Helens exploded, you could still find the ruins of the cabin. Wow. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Apparently all of the, all of the leftover, you know, skeleton and, 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 and ramshackle bits of the cabin were basically destroyed when, when Mount St. Helens went up and it completely changed the landscape of that area. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, you might be able to, to find where the area where it was, but it'd probably be unrecognizable today. You know, what I find interesting about that story is all of the guys, when they left there, swore, you know, made a pact. We'll never talk about this to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and they did. Yeah. <laughs> and they did. Yeah. Willie Johnson says, I've never heard of the lizard one. Yeah. Google Chupacabra. Uh, and um, uh, <laughs> um, Puerto Rico, Chupacabra in Puerto Rico. And, and look at the Google images and some of them, some of the images that people have drawn, uh, it looks very much like a, like a, like a, li like a lizard with that like with a hands. Dragon. Yeah. Like a little <laughs> dragon looking thing. It's kind of weird looking with like glowing red eyes. Um, Bobfoot has a question for you. Yeah. So just a question. Is that third strand of Bigfoot in your Steve Lilly story an actual thing? Uh, yeah, it's a type three. It's known as the Gugway. It's an, a, a, a Choctaw word that means face eater. Uh, they're a very aggressive strand of Bigfoot, and uh, they're pretty much just cannibals. They 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 like to eat people. I guess they find us tasty. But uh, you know, just Google Google Gugway, and yeah, you'll see some pretty terrifying images. I would have a lot more images prepared tonight, but for some reason my overlays are not working. So I've got to get with Josh, my tech guy, and figure out. Why that? What the heck I did wrong? Because obviously I did something. I can't get in, get it to upload any pictures tonight. I um, I wonder if people can see when I post the comments if if the viewers can see them. Well, if that's the case, then I'll let you do handle the comments completely. Uh, I've got a comment up right now from Werewolf Five Six Seven Four. If you guys can see it. Tell me in the comments and I'll and I'll and I'll handle it. But if you can't see it, then I'll let Naomi put a, put up a comment and see if you guys can see it. Okay. Well, let's hear your comments, guys. By the way, hi Facebook user. Nobody's commenting. I guess I don't know if they can see it then. Um, but his comment was, Naomi, can't wait to hear you do Lakeview, man. I think it's the anchor to all the cryptid series. That's awesome. All right, I'm going to close it and let Naomi put up a comment. If you guys can see, oh, Sal Paso says we can see it. Okay. Well, then I guess. Sal, I think I have a story of yours that I'm about to edit on uh, for, for Dixie Cryptid. I could be wrong. I may be wrong, but I think I remember your name from that. Let cool. me put one up. Um, okay. 
Yeah, if you can see it, if you can see the comments while she's doing it, I'll just to avoid confusion, let her do all the comments, and I'll uh, I'll just blab. Okay. Of course, it can talk. It's getting me to shut up. That's a trick. <laughs> uh, can you? Can everybody see that one from uh, Georgian Sherman? Anybody can yeah, see I guess it doesn't matter which one of us put up. They can see it, but we can't see it when the other one, okay. when each other puts it up. How well, weird. Yeah. When I put it up, I'll just read it to you. Awesome. So you know which one I'm talking about. Okay. Well, we're in business then. Naoma, you are officially in charge of the Okay. Comments. I will not be speaking the rest of the night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take all of my concentration. <laughs> Or we can, you know, we can tag out at some point. You get tired of doing it, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll take over. Um, but the, the Ape Canyon story has always been, always kind of fascinated me because uh, not only because did it, did they, they shoot at the creatures. Uh, I, I honestly think the, the pig foot are kind of the victim in the, uh, in the group uh, because yeah, they saw several of the Bigfoot creatures, but they never really got close to them. They were just kind of checking them out. And one of the guys shot one and it fell off into a ravine and they didn't find the body. Uh, they're fairly convinced, convinced they killed it because it, you know, it fell off of a ravine after being shot. Uh, so I would say that Bigfoot attacked the how the, the cabin pretty much as either revenge for them killing one of her, for them taking pot shots at them. So you know, maybe may, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> maybe uh, maybe they uh, were going to get attacked anyway. But if I kind of feel like if they hadn't a shot at one or shot one, uh, they probably would have been left in peace. Werewolf fifty six seventy four says, "Da loved the Steve Lilly story." Awesome! Thank you so much. It was a lot of fun to write. Did they go back? I mean, they they took people back there, right? To Ape Canyon. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, um, there was a recent. Uh, documentary I watched on on uh, Amazon Prime, where they took a group out there looking to find the old site, mm -hmm. and they found some 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 uh, like pieces of metal and stuff from that time period. So they're fairly certain they were in the right area. Uh, but like I said, after the Mount St. Helens eruption, the landscape mm -hmm. is so drastically different. They're not a hundred percent sure they were in the right spot. But even up until the eruption people were going out there to the ruins of that old cabin so there you know it was it, the, the proof that the, there's there's proof that there was a cabin there at one time yeah we know that did, for sure did beck go back with his people um, i don't think they ever did okay. uh, i never read any read anything about them going back they they left mining equipment axes shovels they Double just left it hurts. and when uh, when they were asked if they wanted to go back they're like uh, -uh. nope <laughs> Werewolf 5674, and I don't mean to keep saying the same one over and over again, but says, uh, yeah, Ape Canyon story was a payback, but it was a known bad place. Obviously, it was called Ape Canyon. Yeah. And that is a fun thing to do, by the way, is to look at place names and go back and trace their origins. Oh, um, yeah. You know, things you can, with devil you can look or at, ape. Or, you can look, well, there's a... There's, uh, the Arkansas wild man from the 1800s. Mm -hmm. uh, there are lots of canyons around little places around Missouri. If you look at the old plat maps, uh, you'll see like, like Booger Canyon and uh, the mm -hmm. devil's kitchen and crap like that. Uh, the little place names like that. They didn't get names like that for no reason. You know, it wasn't somebody, well, well, that's a beautiful spring. Let's call it devil springs. <laughs> yeah. Or uh, what is um, the no head or the headless? The, the val Valley of Headless Men. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a lovely vacation place. I know, right? I, I get that, you know, the first guys went there and lost their heads. And then the second guys went there. But people kept going back. Did they not no understand? <laughs> you know, people were like, we don't want to take the kids to Disney World this year. How about the Valley of Headless Men? Let's go there. <laughs> that just sounds awesome. And then there was the lady who disappeared, and and the last time she was seen, she was running up the hillside. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's just a crazy place. There, yeah. And and it's not like you could accidentally drive there and go. Oh, because I did that on Bray Road, by the way, one time. I actually ended up on Bray Road. 
Ooh, cool. Purely by accident. Long, fun story. But when I realized the name of the road I was on, um, I, I was like, oh, yeah, it's like 1130 at night. This is not the place I wanted to be. But since I'm here, I may as well drive it. Um, but uh, the Valley of Headless Men, is not, that's not the case. You have to make an effort to get there. Oh yeah, so it's not it's not bad. like somebody you can take a wrong turn and wind up there. You've you've pretty much got to make a plan. Yeah, that's on you. <laughs> yeah. You went there with a reason. <laughs> Shame on you. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Um, but there's a lot of weird places. So mm -hmm. if I was going to go you know, prospect for gold and they said, Well, you can find it in Ape Canyon or the devil's backbone or whatever. That would be a place I wouldn't look. I would think I, I don't want to be rich that bad. I, I don't need that much money. What? The last three people that own this claim all mysteriously vanished when they went to mine it? Hell yeah, give it to me. I'm going out there. <laughs> yeah, poverty ain't bad, though, with DA. <laughs> there's, well, there's a lot to be said for it. Well, I can tell you one thing. If I ever find myself anywhere near Elkhorn, Elkhorn Wisconsin, me being on Bray Road will not be an accident. I will be up there with intent. Well, the fun story there was I had just recently, uh, you know, this was back in the, it was shortly after um, um, Linda Godfrey had put out her book, mm -hmm. her first book on it. And I, my hometown is straight west of Chicago. You hit the Mississippi River, you're in my hometown. And, but I hate that interstate. It's an awful, it's interstate 80. It's an awful drive. And so anywhere near Alpine Valley, Wisconsin? It's in Illinois. It's south. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. And anyway, so every time I take someone up to the airport, I decide I'm going to go ahead and uh, take back roads home because that's what I like to do. But I get twisted around up there, and sooner or later, I end up in Wisconsin. Every single time I come home from Chicago O'Hare Airport, I know I'm going to do it by way of Wisconsin. And the, long before GPS and, and smartphones and whatnot, I realized I was well and truly lost. And I also realized I did not have my map. And every member of my family is a map fanatic. So I pull over to a a phone booth and I call my brother and he's I like, Hey, how's it going? He says, fine. He says, I said, uh, what you doing? He says, Oh, just sitting here watching TV. I said, got your map. He says, you're lost. <laughs> you uh, wouldn't have to have a map handy, would you? <laughs> and anyway, I realized where I had been and Adam Shepard's like the stream. Thank you, Adam. All right. And that's when I realized I needed to go back. And I wasn't on the road when I called him, but I realized where I had been. And I just ah, I may as well turn around and drive it. <laughs> I, I definitely would have. Of course, I, you see me at two o'clock in the morning driving back and forth down Bray Road with my yeah. dash cam uh, uh, running and leaning out the window with a begging strip going. <laughs> <laughs> One of these days, something's going to go. Oof. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping I'll get it on camera. Uh, George N. Sherman says, got to wonder if Bigfoot isn't Neanderthal. I uh, I would agree with that to an extent. I think there are different types of Bigfoot, uh, especially in different parts of the country. But I think uh, there is a specific type that may be remnant Neanderthal, uh, especially if you look at the book uh, Them and Us by Danny Vendramini. I think that's what he was. He never says it, but I think that's kind of what he was leaning toward. Because if you look over my my shoulder there on the far left side of the screen. That's actually what Danny Vendramini believed Neanderthal actually looked like. Yeah. Very scary. Kind of right? terrifying. Mm -hmm. I just recently read that. <laughs> uh, David Wellman says just got here, but I'm a new fan through Cam's YouTube and Steve Willie. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome. I uh, appreciate that. So I hope you, hope you, uh, hope you enjoy the show. So appreciate you being here. Bobfoot has a question. Where is the Wendigo boundaries and where has it been seen? Mainly, is it in Oregon, California area? The, the Wendigo has been seen from Maine all through Canada, uh, down through the, the uh, Appalachian Mountains. Uh, there are accounts of it being seen in Missouri, Colorado, the, the all through the Rocky Mountains. Uh, the Wendigo is pretty much everywhere it gets cold. 
And that is the one that is cannibalistic. Yes. It's the spirit of hunger. Yeah. Spirit of hunger. There you go. Um, Alan Adam Shepard says, Ooh, stream notifications. Fancy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we try. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Got to look cool. Um, so anyway, what's your next, um, What's your next scary place? Or gosh darn it, DA, I've got Cam on my <laughs> mind tonight. Well, then the next one I wanted to bring up, uh, we kind of talked on, uh, talked about a little, a little bit, a while, uh, a few episodes back, but it's the Bauman incident uh, that Teddy Roosevelt wrote about in his 1893 book, The Wilderness Hunter. Um, that happened uh, up in, I believe it was either Idaho or Montana. Um, a couple of trappers rode up into a, an area where the Native Americans said, "Don't go up there. It, it's bad. It's bad land. You don't want to go up there." But they had they saw lots of beaver sign, which you know was good money in the day. And uh, these two trappers went up there and set out their traps and built a camp. And the first night in camp, something big came into their camp. And uh, Bauman sat up and tried to shoot at it, but it took off before he could get a shot at it. And they heard it near the camp the rest of the night. Well, the next day, they go out to check their traps and come back, and it's wiped out their camp. It's basically just trashed it. Uh, so they rebuild the camp, and uh, Bauman's partner is looking at the footprints. And uh, Bauman's saying, it's just a bear. We had a bear come in and destroy our camp, scatter everything. It's not a big deal. We'll just shoot the bear if it comes back. And his partner's looking at it. He's like, I've never seen a bear walk on two feet. These are huge tracks. It's not a bear. This does not look like bear tracks. And it's walking on two legs and Bauman's like, yeah, whatever. Well, that night it comes into camp again. And this time they saw for sure it was on two legs. Um, so at this point, they're starting to get a little, get a little creeped out. Uh, next day they go to check their traps again, come back, their camp is destroyed again. And at this point they're like, you know what? This ain't worth it. Uh, they said, first thing in the morning, we're going to go pick up all our traps and we're going to get the hell out of there. So the next morning they get up and they go out and they're picking up all their traps together and they get down to the last two or three traps. And Bauman says, I'll go pick up these last two, two or three traps. You go back to camp and break camp down. And as soon as I get back, we're going to get the hell out of here. The guy's like, fine. You know, goes back, starts breaking down the camp. Bauman checks these last couple of traps. One of them, I think one or two of them had beaver in the traps. So he has to take a little while to skin the beaver out, take the pelts. By the time he gets back to camp, a couple hours have passed. He finds his partner laying on the ground, with big fang marks in his neck where something has bit his throat and broken his neck. And then, uh, and, and as the story, the story uses the word gimbled about upon, uh, the body had been like rolled on, which is primate behavior. Uh, primates will do that if they kill something, they'll like, like, like dive on it and roll on it and just gimbal about, I guess is the perfect term. Uh, but it's, it, it is, um, it's, it, it, it freaked Bauman out. He picked up what gear he could carry and he basically just left everything else and ran. Um, and uh, the weird thing about that is, is that's essentially one of the early, early accounts of Bigfoot. It was recorded by Teddy Roosevelt, who would later become president. And there are a lot of people that believe Bauman actually was Teddy Roosevelt because he didn't, because he was a, he was famous for doing stuff like that, for disappearing into the mountains and trapping for months at a time. And yeah, that's something I didn't know. And they think the reason he created the name Bauman was because he thought people would think he was crazy and wouldn't vote for him. People would think he was crazy, probably. And then, weirdly, he's the one that created the National Park Service. <laughs> and the National Parks are where some of the most most unexplained disappearances happen. Hmm. Really weird. Uh, interesting. There's a connection. Paul Lotsky? Uh, This podcast is great therapy for me. I spend many hours driving and helps me during my son's recovery. We spend a lot of time in the woods hunting and camping. Thank you for a great show. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad we can help. Uh, I'm uh, I'm not sure what your son's recovering from, but we wish him well. Uh, I'll I'll add him to the prayer list. Uh, So I hope he gets a, has a speedy recovery. And uh, I, I do, I do uh, spend quite a bit of time in the woods myself where I, I, I did prior to my back injury and I hope to soon again, but uh, I, I completely understand. I love spending time out in the woods as well. And it's just, yeah, you go, you get away from people to find yourself sometimes. And that's just a great place to do it. 
David Wellman says, DA, I'm right with you on your theory about why the National Park has come about to be. It, it makes perfect sense. Mm. And if you look at the David Polites Missing 411 series, there are so many disappearances in national parks, and the National Park Service will not talk about it. Polites has been stonewalled so many times about the disappearances. Uh, it, and if if that's the reason and I, again, I say that's why, that I, that's my theory, that, that Teddy Roosevelt did it as as areas to basically keep people away from where these dangerous cryptids live. Um, and if that's the case, then that would explain why the National Park Service doesn't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I think um, at one time he, when he made the request, they said they could generate it for him, but it would cost him a couple of million dollars. Yeah, something. like, like 1.9 million or something ridiculous. Yeah. He filed a Freedom of Information Act uh, request for all missing persons, and they, they just jerked him around. Yeah. Uh, Werewolf5674 says, do you have a good reference or site for Native American lore? I, I do some research <laughs> online, but a lot of my Native American lore knowledge comes from my Uncle Buddy, who was the actual real-world inspiration for Jay Matoska. Uh, he's passed away now, but I grew up listening to stories and talking to him and, and just a hell of a guy. Um, taught me how, taught me how to track. Uh, taught me to be a better shot than I ever was before. Uh, just a, a hell of a good guy. Taught me a lot about... He was full-blood Cherokee. I, I call him my uncle, but he married my aunt. Uh, so he was my uncle by marriage, but he was always Uncle Buddy to me. Everybody called him Buddy, even though his real name wasn't Buddy. That's just what he went by. Um, when we lost him... A year ago, Christmas, and uh, I, uh, I, I missed the hell out of him. He was a hell of a good guy, and like a second dad. And uh, yeah, I, I, I chose to honor him by naming the character Jay Matoska after him. That was pretty much just him in a nutshell, uh, just Jay Matoska. Cool. Uh, Bob Foote says, uh, I think it's more Gigantopithecus. I think that's in reference to the Neanderthal. Yeah, I I, uh, I think some of it could be gig gigantopithecus. Like I said, that um, the uh, researcher Matt Squatch on YouTube uh, believes that there is 10 types of Bigfoot. And I don't 100% agree with his assessment because there's a couple of things he puts in there that I don't really think are actually Bigfoot. They're kind of Bigfoot adjacent, to use a term. They're kind of in that family, but they're not Bigfoot. Um, but I think some of the more primate-like uh, our, our primate-like types of Bigfoot are, are probably more closely related to Gigantopithecus. But then there are some of them that are tool users and clearly hominids. Uh, so, you know, I think what we're seeing is relic populations of more than one species. Now, and that's just my, I am no expert. I, I make no claims about being an expert <clears throat> on any subject. These are just my opinions based on everything I've read. Yeah, I, uh, I, to be clear, if it ends in a D, it's a family, as in the scientific classification, genus, species, family, so on and so forth up the line. And if it ends in N, it is a subfamily. So the hominid family is the four great apes, mm -hmm. which is humans, orangutans, gorillas, and chimpanzees. Um, but the hominins, there's only one surviving species, according to science, and that's humans. And I believe that they, they fall somewhere in the. I would agree. I, I think I think there are uh, there are some of the subgroup of Bigfoot that may be hominins, an yeah. offshoot of our genetic our genetic breakaway at some point, yeah. maybe even before we broke away from the other great apes. Yeah. But Very I, mean, I don't close think they're like Australopithecus or anything like that. I just think that if you're going to classify them, they would come into the hominin family. Um, <laughs> uh, Werewolf says some act like apes and some act <laughs> and some human like. Yeah, yeah, that's that's people too. <laughs> I was thinking that, but I wasn't going to say <laughs> I know a lot of people who act like apes. <laughs> Poo so. flinging and everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Most uh, reporters these days fling a lot of poo. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I've often wondered uh, what 
would happen because I you see shows where the researchers are out there making howls and call blasting and taking a baseball bat and beating on 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 trees. Uh, you know, how do you know the call you're making isn't a mating call? Do you have a <laughs> do you have a do you have a plan in place if Bigfoot comes out of the woods yeah. looking for love? <laughs> he comes shows shows up with a dozen roses. You're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. You'll go to a prom. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> Definitely. I would like to see one walk out of the woods under any, any circumstance. Cause I'm pretty sure the producer would be out there like, go back, go back. We find you. We're done. <laughs> we can't have this. Yeah, we can't prove it. Then we're done. Then it becomes Show's a nature over. documentary. Right. <laughs> That, yeah, we take that crypto off of the zoology and it's not nearly as interesting. We're back to Marlon Perkins. <laughs> people, people like mysteries. They always do. Yeah, definitely. And I don't I don't foresee us definitively solving anything until, uh, excuse me, until a body is flopped on a desk. I mean, look at the uh, the old British Museum back in the 1800s when they would come back, these hunters would come back from, from uh uh, safaris in Africa and go, Hey, the natives are telling about these, these giant apes called gorillas. And they're like, Oh no, those couldn't possibly exist. We would have cataloged them eons ago. No, no. It natives. It's uh, no, no. And then someone drags in a body and they're like, Oh yes, there it is. We'll name it. We found it. We discovered it. We get to name it. And that's what's going to happen with Sasquatch. They're going to, science is going to be like, no, 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 they don't exist. Pfft. Oh, Sasquatch is bilious. <laughs> like, oh, 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 now you're taking credit for it. Yeah. So suddenly we're all not idiots. Oh, no, you're not idiots about this. That chupacabra <laughs> couldn't possibly exist. <clears throat> well, shit, uh, that one exists as well. <laughs> That's what it's going to take. Um, I hate to sound crass. I'm, I'm not making fun of the British too much but uh that, you know, that's the way it is it's the way science has always been like uh the coelacanth they they believe they found they found fossil records and believe the damn thing went extinct what 25 million years ago and then that's one day discovered the people off madagascar had been eating the things for generations yeah. like oh yeah here, here you want one <laughs> so yeah what yeah. Was, was thought to be encrypted was very very real because the people were like oh yeah yeah that's pretty good yeah yeah we yeah. We, we, we eat them all the time <laughs> little lemon little pepper yeah <laughs> little, <laughs> wrap them in a banana leaf put them on the coals it's really yeah. good <laughs> little oyster sauce <laughs> Uh, I can't say the name. Owissa? Owissa Khan? What's your question? It says, I have a question. What is it? Fire away. It's yeah. closer to the bottom. Oh, there it is. All right. Hang on. Let me. I got to get rid of one before I can bring up the other. Question is, well, then I have a statement instead. Hunting humans is illegal. Environmental DNA can prove them. I agree. Um, I mean, I I would never advocate hunting one. Uh, I I'm I I grew up hunting deer, and if we shot something, we ate it. Uh, I'm not advocating going out hunting one. That's not saying if I go out in the woods, I'm not going to be armed. I, I I'm not planning on getting my my arm ripped off and beat over the head with it. But you know, there are other dangerous animals in the woods besides a you know potential cryptid. I, if I go armed in the woods, it's for self protection only. I am not advocating hunting one. I, I don't advocate the killing of one of these creatures unless it was in self-defense. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a firmly in the, I know these things exist camp. I'm not, I'm not, well, I just believe I, you know, I don't take it on faith. I've had enough close encounters in my lifetime that, that I know there's something out there. Um, and I firmly, I, I it's to, to me, it's firmly established in my head and I go out to these places and film like I did at LBL, like I did just recently a week or so ago down at Joe Bald campground here in Missouri. Um, I go to these places to get film footage and to talk about these places and to, to show you the places. If something walks up and goes, hi, me Bigfoot, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with that. But if all we get is sounds in the woods, I'm okay with that too. I'm not going out any of these places to get definitive proof. I just love going to these places and talking about these legends and creatures and, and bringing them to you. My goal is to find a Bigfoot who doesn't advocate killing people. Uh David Wellman says, uh, Naomi, Neoma, sorry, I pronounced my own name wrong. <laughs> it's 
<laughs> I see your narrated style. Uh, I love your narrated style. Nice to match your face to your voice. And yeah, now you know I have a voice for radio or a face for radio. Oh. And DA, you're funny as shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I try. I don't always succeed, but I try. Um, I wish I knew how to pronounce this right. Awisa Khan. I'm, I'm saying that's probably how I would spell pronounce it. I was a lucky child. I was face to face with a female Bigfoot for three and a half years. I, I played with her. She did not advocate killing humans. That's the one I want to meet. There you go. I, I think a lot of people have had nonviolent interactions with, with cryptids. Uh, and, but I, I associate that the same way I do, like the guy that they called the grizzly man that went up and lived with grizzly bears in Alaska. Timothy he, Treadwell. Yeah, he did perfectly fine until he came across the wrong bear at the wrong time. If a bear is well fed and got a full stomach, it's probably going to ignore you. Most encounters with bears, they will head the other direction. Black bears, especially. You know, I've, I've seen black bears up close and went, stack! And you know, it's all it's hauling ass into the woods, uh, but you know, there, you, you meet that me. bear. Do what? I'm sorry. <laughs> when you said scat, I would have assumed you were talking to me, and I'd have been <laughs> the one running into the woods. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you meet that one bear that's too old to hunt anymore, or is sick, or has not been eating well, or is about to go into hibernation, is desperate for food. You suddenly got on the menu, and, and I think that's that exactly what happened to Timothy Treadwell. I mean, and his girlfriend got and her eaten girlfriend. as well. Mm -hmm. Well, that uh, yeah, that I think can happen with any wild animal, and I'm not saying that all of these cryptids are wild animals. I think in some cases they are, uh, especially in cases like the dog man. I don't think there's a lot of intelligence there. I think they're more. I, a lot of the encounters that you talk hear about dog men, people describe the creature as appearing evil, and that just kind of worries me. Yeah. Um, yeah, this, so you know, we we never know what that's gonna what that how that's gonna turn out, um, but I you know I I think it depends on the mood of the creature and the circumstances. You might have ninety nine peaceful encounters, but that one day it's in a bad mood or just really hungry, and you know that's that's why they say don't put food out for bears. Uh, people that feed bears that, that have bears coming up to their house and they put food out that one day you forget that bear may rip the door off your house and come inside and ransack your kitchen. Yep. Same thing within the other wild animal. That's why I say don't, don't feed them, especially close to your house. Right. I knew a man many, many years ago who, uh, and we're talking, I'm old. So that we're talking decades ago and he, uh, when he was a kid, they found a rattlesnake and they pulled its fangs and they kept it and played with it for months thinking, well, it can't bite us. It has no fangs. They grew and back. They grew back. And surprisingly, they didn't ever realize they grew back. It wasn't until they released it and it turned around and hissed at them that that was the first time they had ever seen that and they'd been playing with it all that time with those fangs and it never chose to bite them but it could have chosen made that choice at any time because it never felt threatened and they were feeding it right uh bob uh, says is... Neoma, we already found a bigfoot that's nice her name is patty <laughs> yeah she was really nice she walked away politely um i'm getting behind on comments uh Wissa says uh, they have periods like other females. And um, also, I track them for fun. Um, I do too. I just do it from my car. <laughs> uh, default name says, or, or if they just hate people, they will attack. Yeah, there are animals who have bad attitudes towards people, and rightly so. Mountain lions are like that. You're yeah. not going to pet that kitty. No. Or you won't do it twice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it says, um, Oessa says, not animals. They don't act like that. And I, I agree. Like I said, I, I think some of the, what they believe are subspecies or different types of Bigfoot are 
hominins very similar to humans. And even some Indian tribes referred to them, I'm sorry, Native American tribes referred to them as just another tribe of people. But then there are other types that are extremely aggressive, like the Gugway, or there are several other, there are several other like the wood booger, uh, which which is featured more heavily down in like like Texas big thicket country and in Oklahoma they're very aggressive. Uh, the swamp ape, the skunk ape from mm -hmm. Florida and, uh, and up through Georgia and, and some of the swampy areas, those are known to be aggressive. I don't think those so much are hominins. I think they're more hominids. And uh, so I, that's why I firmly believe there's multiple types of these. I think they're, you know, we would very easily, you know, find find types of, of Bigfoot that are very much like people and could probably be communicated with under the right circumstances. But you turn the corner and run into a Gugway and you're a missing 411 case. Um, Werewolf says, human or beast, if it tries to take my life, I will take it. And I don't blame it. That's how I feel. Yeah. I don't I don't intend to shoot one unless it's coming after me or, or one of mine. And that's yeah. just and that's just any animal. I mean, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not I'm not hunting anything anymore for food. I'm I'm more concerned with I'd like to go out and take pictures and and listen and get get recordings and do videos so I can put them on the podcast. The only way I'm going to shoot something is if it's trying to kill me. I'm not one of those guys that hears a noise and puts 20 rounds in, into the air or into a tree, thinking you know panic fire. Now you guys go watch the. Uh, the Joe Bald video. I was armed during that entire time and never even touched it because I never felt threatened. Yeah. Um, I just, I, I spent almost 20 years in law enforcement. You know, I, I know you don't touch your weapon unless you intend to shoot something. And I'm, I'm just not going to panic fire. David Wellman says, well, 3 a.m. comes early. So you guys have a great night and God bless you and hope all your babies are born naked. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, sir. Hope you have a good night. <laughs> Mine were born fairly naked. <laughs> naked, um, naked and hairy yeah. ch uh says i wonder if the woman screaming if that might be them giving birth your input could and, be you know, um you know there are different types of bigfoot uh, uh vocalizations that have been reported like the ron moorhead sierra sounds um Lots of different type of vocalizations. One they refer, refer, refer to as the siren sound because it, it's like it gets it, it, it kind of ululates, uh, and I think that one's more of a territorial call or a challenge. Uh, but I would say some of the some of the uh, calls could very well be that. I don't we we don't know we don't know enough about them as a species to be able to say. Uh, but I think uh, we are close to having them more known. Uh, the government is finally starting to be forthcoming about UFO sightings. I think full full disclosure on creatures like this might not be that that far-fetched of a thought. Awissa says, black, brown, and red-haired in Northwest are more friendly. Agree. Southern are more primate. Um, I do believe, I, I do know that the Southern tend to be a lot more aggressive. It mm -hmm. seems like the ones in, you know, I agree with that. I think you already covered that. Um, uh, the shrill scream is a female looking for a mate. That makes sense. Yeah. So don't make the shrill scream in the woods. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you unless you, you may not like candy or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unless you're prepared to slow dance with an eight foot Bigfoot, don't make the scream. <laughs> Me oh, lead. Right. Okay, okay. I'll <laughs> dance backwards. It's okay. <laughs> Joe ABN says hello from Mount Grove, Missouri. Hey, you're just down the road from me. I'm in Springfield. Uh, yeah, there's actually quite a few sightings in the Mountain Grove area. Um, it, uh, it's a pretty squatchy area. As you as you head from Springfield, like you're heading toward the boot heel down toward Cape Girardeau or. Uh, uh, you know, any of those little towns in the boot heel. I'm Cape Girardeau is a pretty good sized town, but when we were on our way to LBL, we went down through Mountain Grove and everything. And uh, that's some pretty thickly wooded area down there. There'd be a lot of places down there where, where it'd be awesome. I would love to go down uh, somewhere near the current river and just do some recordings and, and check stuff out. Cause I know there's a lot of sightings in that area, which is why I chose Eminence, Missouri as a location for a lot of the action. Well, actually most of the action in apex predator blood moon. 
Bill Sloan, Bill Sloan says, you don't have to shoot a Bigfoot. If you're like me, start running. They'll slip in the trail of feet <laughs> behind me as I run. <laughs> well, I'm old and slow. I have to walk with a cane, so I'm not running anywhere fast. So uh, My goal is to go where you are because I could probably outrun your cane. <laughs> you probably can. Uh, let me see. Um Werewolf says in the Sierra sound, the talking freaks me out. Me too. Same here. Uh, to use a cam phrase, they're talking Ghibli. Uh, <laughs> it definitely sounds like a language. Um, and they, the, and uh, Ron Moorhead, we had him on the show a couple months back. And they gave the Sierra recordings to a Navy crypto linguist. And the guy's like, yeah, that's a language. That, that is def definitely a language. And, but I don't know what they're saying. We, we, yeah. we got no way of translating it. They fed it into a computer, a Navy computer, and it recognized it as a language. So it's not like the guys from the, the, the Ron Moorhead and his, his hunting partners faked that because they would have had to have created an entire language. And some of the language that, that when they measured it on an oscilloscope was both above and below human vocal range. Mm. So it's, it, was, it was not definitely the, what was making the sounds was not human. No, humans are incapable of that. So um, here's this one from Alyssa again. That is how we discovered her. She was sitting in the top of one of our oak trees. My dad put the flashlight on her while she was screaming and having a baby. Is that what I understand? Or screaming a mate for a mate. Oh, screaming for a mate. Maybe that was it. Um, that's interesting. Um uh, well, my question is when you have contact like that, you have the ability to bring more evidence to the table than anybody else. Um, I agree. You know, for in bringing them to proving their existence also gives us the opportunity to give them a certain amount of protection. Like so, stop logging their environment. Yeah. Thank you, logging industry. Okay. Werewolf says, I live in Hannibal, but I have been around Southern Missouri since the 60s. Um, I would love to chat with you offline sometime, Werewolf. Uh, I know there are a lot of dogman sightings up around Hannibal. Uh, in fact, uh, that radio station from yeah. Hannibal just uh, picked up the article that, that – uh, the eagle. The, the eagle. Uh, they they posted an article which was based on the Dixie Cryptid story. Uh, Dixie Cryptid. Uh, what if it's true? No, podcast. What if it's true? Podcast. Yeah. Uh, about uh, dogman yeah. werewolf sightings in rural Missouri. But they were the funny thing is, is it was all short stories I wrote. Yeah. Which I, I think it's hilarious because they were reporting it like they were actual accounts. Uh, but the uh, stories were based on stories that I'd been told as, as a young man. So I guess there is a kernel of truth to it. Uh, I, I would love to pick your brain because I'm planning on coming to the Hannibal area sometime, maybe this month or next month to shoot some video up there and, and maybe look into some of the dogman sightings up there. Patty says, hola, DA. Hi, Patty. How are you doing? Oh, and here's another one. Uh, I lost it when I clicked off of Oh, there it is. Let me write down uh, uh, where we'll see email address before okay. I, uh, I lose it completely. It's um, Meg says, good evening. Meg here, Margaret Mills. How you Hi, doing, Meg. Meg? How are you doing? Oh, I broke that okay. word up way wrong. Huh. Okay. Um. Okay. Uh, the the next uh, big encounter that I wanted to to talk about, and we just did a show about it. What just last week was the seizure at Hanobia. I'm not going to go into great detail about that because we did do, like I said, we did an entire show on it. But that's another encounter where in, where cryptids it turned violent. Um. And it was over food. So I don't know whether these were what you would consider 
the thinking type of Sasquatch. Uh, but I do know the ones in Oklahoma and the big thicket area of Texas tend to be extremely aggressive. Uh, the one that's why the locals refer to them as wood boogers. Uh, so I don't think these are the ones that would be tool users or, or hominins. I think they're the more of the hominid variety. And it ended up ended up being a gunfight and over these people's land. Uh, and if you want to know that in more detail, just check out that previous show uh, that we did on Siege at Hanobia. Oh, or Hanabi. Oklahoma pronounces stuff weird. Like, yeah, they do. <laughs> like Miami. It's M-I-A-M-I. -I. Not in Oklahoma. That's Miami. Yeah, Miami. In hey, Hanabi. I have an aunt whose name is spelled S-Y-L-V-I-A, and she's Sylvie. <laughs> there she was. She passed away. I had a great aunt named Exie, X-I-E. Yeah? Yeah. That's kind of cool. Yeah, she was supposed to be clairvoyant. I don't know. I never met her. She was passed away before I was born. Uh, okay, I've got the email address written down. Um, okay. I'll send you an email later. Or you, or you can email me at any time at daroberts at daroberts.net. Uh, that goes directly to me. That's my my website and email address. So if you want to shoot me an email, you can. I can uh, I can change the uh, the banner and show that. I think this is in response to my comment about uh, giving evidence. Oh, I don't have uh, that yes, one in there. Yes, but getting people to understand what you are saying is hard for some to take in, and that's true. But the more evidence you provide, the easier it will be for them to accept it. Exactly. Um, again, a lot of a lot of us, you know, that, that look into this are not looking to be the definitive proof. I I, I don't want to be that guy. I don't, I don't care uh, enough to to want to be the the guy that you know says here's the proof and make the British Royal Museum go. Oh, it's a new species. I get to name it. I discovered it. No, you didn't. I just brought it to you, you idiot. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I don't want to be that guy. I I love looking into the into the stories and hearing the accounts and doing doing my books and I like to do the videos. But as far as trying to prove it one way or the other, some people are going to believe it, some aren't, and I'm not looking to 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 try to try to prove it to anybody. I know it's proven to myself, and I'm good with that. Yeah. Um, OSA says the boogers may have felt that it was their land, and I do believe they're territorial. So yeah, I would go with that. Very possible. Uh, they were definitely fighting over resources. They were they were coming mm -hmm. after the deer that they had in their their deep freeze. Um, are we going to talk about the other one, the Choctaw one? Oh, I did not write that one down. Um, yeah, supposedly there was a, a Bigfoot war in Oklahoma between. Uh, a group of Choctaw and a group of Bigfoot that had been taking people out and eating them. Um, and when they finally found the, the troop, the troop of Bigfoot that had been doing it and the, the, the battle began once they finally won the battle, uh, the, I believe the brothers were called the, the brothers involved were, it was like Tubby T U B E E. I think that's what it was. Uh, but it's, it's a really cool. It's the Choctaw Oklahoma Bigfoot war. Uh, you can Google the story. Yeah. Uh, I believe Magnus. it was the. Oh, go ahead. No, I think it was the Tubbies. I believe that's what it was. But they, when they finally won the battle, uh, the horses wouldn't go anywhere near the creatures because of the because of the smell and out of fear. Uh, but they found a pile of bodies when they when they finally won the fight, and they just piled them up and burned them. Uh, yeah. They weren't again. They weren't looking to prove anything. They were looking to stop them from killing the local villagers. Yeah, they were taking away their women and children and basically eating them. So, yeah, that was a bad thing. Uh, Meg says, just finished just now reading Operation Blood Eagle. Rocked. Awesome. I'm glad you liked it. Um, I, uh, I, I really enjoyed writing that one. It was a lot of fun. And George Ann Sherman wants to know, how did you meet Cam? Was that for you or for me? Well, let's both tell it. You want me to start? You go right ahead. I started listening to Cam. Um, good to see you too, Meg, by the way. Um, I started listening to Cam probably six to eight months after he started. I know I was within the first 1,500 subscribers. And um, I am an editor by trade. And um, he kept talking about wanting to write a book. And I finally, and I kept commenting on his, his uh 
in his videos, I can help you do that because that is more what I do. I like to help independents through the entire process because there's more than, you know, you have to write your book, you have to have it edited. There's the, there's designing it and formatting it and there's book covers and there's, if you want to sell it on in a store or on Amazon, you have to have an ISBN number. Um, mm -hmm. There's just all kinds of things. And I know the entire process. And so I kept and finally I sent him an email and said, you know, if you're serious about this, I can help you. And he responded back immediately and called me and we were talking and, and I was telling him, you know, basically what I just told you in a lot more detail. And uh, he said, would you be interested in editing some of the stories I do on the show? He had had a couple of other people who he had offered that opportunity to, and they, they said they could do it, but they couldn't. And then when he tried to ask them to do it a little different or the more the way he wanted it, they were just like, nah, I can't do that. And he was surprised that I sent it back to him in, in about a day. And I sent back exactly what he wanted. And the next thing I knew, I had 20 more stories. I think he's, <laughs> at one point he was sending me about 20 stories at a time. And I was getting them about every two or three days. And uh, one thing led to another. He kept telling me he liked the sound of my voice. And so uh, he asked me if I would start recording for him. And that's how that came about. Now, DA, how did you meet him? Well, I'd, I'd been listening to him for a while. Uh, when I worked uh, both uh, security at the hospital, because we did outside patrols, and when I was working uh, for the Walnut Grove Police Department, I worked overnights out there. Um, for long stretches, I was doing nothing but driving around the campus of the hospital or driving around the little bitty town of Walnut Grove with nothing going on and nothing coming over the radio. So... I would put on podcasts and listen to them. And that's when I discovered Cam. And I really enjoyed Dixie Cryptids. And when I started doing books that featured cryptids, I sent him an email, said, hey, my name is D.A. Roberts. I'm an author. Uh, I write books that that, that, that uh, are primarily horror, but some of them feature cryptids. I was wondering if you'd like to talk about that sometime. And I didn't hear anything from him for about five, six months. And uh, he gets a ton of emails, so I, I was not surprised. I didn't honestly didn't expect to hear anything at all. Um, and uh, he emailed me back one day, and he's like, "Oh yeah, absolutely." And so we got to talking, and uh, I sent him a couple of short stories, which you know that you guys narrated on the podcast. And him and I've talked on the phone a half a dozen times, and you know, he's just a hell of a good guy. And we got to laughing about his Steve Lilly stories, and he offered to have me write one. And yeah, you know, we just, I, I really. Yeah, he's he's becoming a really good friend. I mean, I I love dealing. I love dealing working with the Dixie Cryptid and What If It's True podcast people. I mean, got Naomi on my podcast anytime she wants. I, I love having her on. I made you a couple of me off of it. <laughs> <laughs> I made a couple of really good friends when I was just looking to find an avenue to promote my books. And uh, it's amazing what you run into when you talk to good people. And I thoroughly enjoy the relationship with Cam and Naomi, and it's it's awesome. And I consider them both very good friends. And, you know, that's the fun thing that, that this is all brought about is the fact that uh, I'm, I mean, my cup says it all. I'm an introvert, introverted, but willing to discuss books. And I'm not very good at, at making friends, but I really have come up with two really great friends here and two of the best people I think I've met in years. And I, I start talking to them and I know they think, God, would this woman shut up? Because I just, I can't, I, I just enjoy their friendship so much. And my husband, <laughs> God love him. He's like, <laughs> you know, what's the deal? <laughs> Why do you, and, and I said, I don't know. I've never been good at making friends, but apparently it's because I was always trying to make friends with people who didn't share my interests. And I just really have, and feel very blessed that I have made friends with both Cam and DA. Um, Meg says, I really must say this new format on YouTube is great. Very clear and easy to hear you. DA, the Steve Lilly team, Odin rocked. Love your stories. Next book, Lakeview Man. Woohoo! And Naoma is going to be doing the Lakeview Man series. I'm excited. Uh, I, 
I had a narrator for the first Lakeview Man. It's already out and available in audio. Uh, and I would plan had planned on having him do the entire Lakeview Man series, but he was offered a job where he was not going to have the time to do narrations anymore. Um, so he's he's actually helping make documentaries. Uh, so I, you know, I, I he's I, I tell him he, when he told me he's like, man, I am so sorry. I'm like, dude, go. I get it. Uh, you know, he's chasing his passion. So I wish, wish him nothing but the best. But yeah, I, when I, when I, when I wrote Lakeview Man 2, it was the main character was Amanda Clark, Amanda Sanchez Clark from the first one. Um, and I knew I wanted to have a female narrate it. And Naoma popped up at the exact right time. I'm like, Hey, would you like to narrate this, uh, this book? <laughs> and she's got such a great style. I love her voice and I can't wait to have her narrate all of the Lake Pee Man series. Uh, Alyssa adds the Sierra recordings are two males having a basic conversation, two friends saying hello to each other and catching up. Did a rough lit translation about 10 years ago. Um, that's pretty amazing. I don't even think the experts were able to do that. Yeah, they're uh, the, the guys. Uh, if you get hold of Ron Moorhead, I'm sure he'd love to hear the translations. Yeah, you know, uh, we had, like I said, we had Ron on the show. You know, he, hell of a guy, easily approachable. Um, find him on Facebook and shoot him a message. I'm sure he'd love to hear it. George Ann Sherman says vampires. Uh, as in, are they real or am I doing books about them? Because I they think, do show up in a book. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that may be so a far. question. <laughs> uh, you, you will see them appear in the fourth installment of the Apex Predator series, Apex Predator Horned Moon. And uh, my vampires are pretty nasty. <laughs> I uh, got, a, got some artwork from a friend of mine today I want to share with everybody. Um, his name's Jared George. He's a great, a great artist. Um, and he, um, he sent me some artwork. What the, that did me to do that. Um, he sent me some artwork that I want to share with everybody. And, uh, I think you guys would get a kick out of it. <laughs> I do love that. I think it's hilarious. It's on my author page. Uh, but I, I may, uh, may actually make it like the background here on the show. I'm going to get it on a t-shirt too. So I can't wait to do that. That's going to be <laughs> That's going to be fun. Alyssa says, um, yeah, experts, I gave my translation to John Bendernagel. Uh, I'm, I get to talk to John Bendernagel, and I actually liked him a lot. I thought he was, <laughs> he pulled me out of a really tough situation when I was in college doing um, my, uh, your basic required speech course we got to the last one where you have to the where you have to convince people and they gave us a subject and i picked bigfoot and then the professor said and you have to speak to an expert and <laughs> and and literally there are no experts i mean there's no right. experts in something that hasn't been proven <laughs> and so um I I was desperate. I mean, how was I going to come up with an expert? But um, John Bendernagel, bless his heart, spent two hours on the phone with me, and he gave and I wound up with an A on the speech. And it was I would have not gotten that A if I hadn't found somebody willing to, um, with some credentials anyway. <laughs> and I miss him. I miss him a lot. He was a great guy. Never had the privilege to meet the man. I wish I had. Yeah, he was he was a very kind, generous man. And, you know, he certainly didn't have to spend two hours on the phone with me when we'd arranged for a 20 minute interview. But he he just was he never saw one. He never had a sighting of his own, but he was a firm believer. And that was risky for him because he was a, a wildlife biologist. Yeah, uh, a lot of scientists, uh, like even Jane Goodall has come out talking about how she believes it's possible that Bigfoot's out there. Scientists risk a lot coming forward and you know, giving an opinion on the Bigfoot subject uh, because, you know, you they can get blackballed within the community and get a bad reputation. It ruins their research and everything. So scientists coming forward and, and saying, I believe this, uh, are taking a risk. Yeah. Uh, Hooter Transport says Sasquatch slash Sabi. 
went through chemotherapy. Now he's called Chemo Sabi. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, anyway. Oh, here's another one. I'm I'm trying to backtrack and catch up because I know I'm getting behind on these. Um, Melissa says, I loved him. He was awesome. Gave him a lot of info. Yeah, he was truly awesome. So let's talk about another one. Uh, the next one on the, on the list is the Siege of Lockett Ranch. Uh, and that happened in 1948 in the little town of Taylor, Mississippi, uh, which I've talked to a few people that have been through that area. And they're like, yeah, it's creepy as hell, especially at night. Uh, I, I'm planning at some point, not sure when, uh, but I do plan on going to Taylor, Mississippi, because they, they say that not only is the survivors of the Lockett family still living in that area, uh, you can actually go to the old homestead, and that's the plan, is to go out there and see if I can find the actual Lockett, the Lockett family ranch that they abandoned uh, because of dogman attacks and see what I can find. Uh, the Choctaw said that that was cursed land uh, when the Lockett family built a farm on it, and uh, it turned out they weren't wrong. <laughs> yeah, the uh, I think that there are people down there that will tell you don't go on certain roads at night. Stay out mm -hmm. of certain areas. If you're going to go out there, don't go here. And, of course, that'll be the place you go. Oh, you bet. <laughs> that My favorite story about that area is actually not the Lockett Ranch one. It was the lineman mm -hmm. who was out at about dusk repairing yeah. a line and got stuck up in the bucket because they were underneath him, and he was freaking out. Do you blame him? <laughs> Oh, no, not at all. I mean, that he survived without having a heart attack impresses me. Yeah, they would have found my dead body up in the bucket. Draped over in the bucket. <laughs> I'm sure he probably needed a change of shorts when he was down. I'm sure. Absolutely. Um, oh, Meg. Meg says, um, so I am moving to a farm with corn next to the property. <laughs> Yeah. Good yeah. You, that. you you uh you might see some stuff or at least hear it. Mm -hmm. it find out how close the nearest cemetery is too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you for some weird reason there seems to be a lot of activity around cemeteries. Uh one of the videos, one of the early videos on my YouTube channel, uh is uh, an old cemetery dates back to just after the Civil War, like the 1880s or 1890s here in Missouri called the the Care Cemetery, K E R R. And it's somewhere in the butt crack of nowhere between Billings, Missouri and, and Mount Vernon, Missouri on one of the back roads. And it, when I say it's in the butt crack of nowhere, I mean it's in the middle of freaking nowhere. Uh, my wife and I found it the first time while well, geocaching. And I wasn't, wasn't out there planning on doing anything like taking pictures or anything. We were just geocaching because there was a cache in the cemetery at the time. And we went there with the kids and we got there right at dusk and had a really weird experience. First off, near the back of the cemetery in the thick woods, I could hear wood knocking, which I knew what that meant, but I didn't want to scare the kids because the boys were pretty small. And I'm like trying to round everybody up and head them back, head them back toward the house. And then we heard something moving in the trees, like something big, like it was coming through the trees. And uh, my wife, you know, she's five foot two and, uh, I always tell her she's got little bitty short legs, but she managed to beat every one of us back to the van. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm hurting the kids and watching watching back over my shoulder. And uh, the weird thing is the way the gate is set up on that cemetery, um, it opens uphill. So you kind of got to, you can open it either direction. But when I opened it, I opened it uphill. And uh, that was you know, you had to put some effort in opening the gate. Well, I'm letting the boys get in the van because they had to jump in the back and get in their car seats. So I'm staying outside the van watching and I shut that gate and I latched it. It had like a metal bolt that locked, locked over in place. I turned around and walked to the driver's side of the van. And when I looked back, the gate was opening uphill. Oh my. So, and that was right at dusk. It was just getting dark. Uh, needless to say, I, I drove and I dove in the van and I don't think I slowed down till we hit Springfield. <laughs> nice of them to open the gate for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would have been terrifying to me. Meg says, I was just going to make a comment on that Neoma about the guy in the bucket. Do you know of any other stories about that besides the, the near, near Taylor? Ranch? 
Yeah. Apparently, uh, there are a lot of dogman sightings near Taylor, Mississippi. Um, and it's, it, it, I, I can't, I'm not bringing any directly to, uh, to, uh, mind. Uh, some of them are very similar to the Bray Road. Uh, saw it eating road, killed the side of the road. Uh, mm -hmm. Another guy said that it ran, paced his car, right, and was like looking in the window, trying to get into the into the car, uh, all the way up until he cleared like 50 miles an hour. And he was uh, he was like accelerating the whole time, and it was keeping pace. I guess when he when he broke 50 miles an hour, it broke off. Uh, but there there are a lot of accounts coming out of that area, and uh, my plan is to to go down there and do some filming both day and night. Uh, so. Yeah. If, Keep if, fingers uh, crossed. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I, I do want to go down there. Just to clarify, make sure that your phone is hooked to GPS and oh, you drop it. In and I have the new dash cam. So, okay. And the, yeah. da the dash cam has audio. So if I see it, I don't have to stop filming while I'm driving. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> and if it steps out in the road, you're going to hear me go, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> um, Meg says there's a cemetery down from where she lives. Along power lines, I saw a huge nest with uh, like structure and trees years ago. Like I have said that before, I do not look for them. I pay attention. And sometimes paying attention nets its own reward. You'll see yeah. stuff you uh, you don't necessarily even want to see sometimes. Um, but it it's it's always always good to know your surroundings. Josh Jones says, LOL, Billings is nearly nowhere. He's not wrong. <laughs> he is not wrong. It's, it's, it, it's, uh, it's in a weird position. Uh, it kind of it falls along like the county line of like two lines uh, mm -hmm. of two counties. So if, you, if you're a Billings cop and I've got a couple friends who were, if you arrest someone, depending on where, what part of town you arrested them in, depends on which county jail you have to take them to. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's just confusing as hell. <laughs> Meg says, drive fast, LOL. <laughs> um, yeah, I've uh, I've heard some incidents where driving fast actually wasn't good enough, that they're pretty fast animals. And they're not like cheetahs, which are really fast and short mm -hmm. bursts. They can they apparently endurance. take for a while, yeah. I've heard of people who spotted them in the woods and were either in some cases they were like leaving food for them. I mean, in some cases it was a hunter that took a pot shot at one uh, and then drove home and it later showed up at his house. I I've heard of, they, of that very specific story. A guy was out in the woods with his young son and before he could stop them, the young son took a shot at it. And when they got home, they're standing in their kitchen, has a big glass sliding door. And there it is standing there in the, in the, on the patio, staring in at them. And, and again, I will say for the record, I have no intention of shooting unless I don't have a choice. Josh says, by the way, the show looks and sounds beautiful. It's because Neoma's here. If it was just me, everybody would be running and screaming. <laughs> yes, that's that's so true. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the, the the background. Should say alone. <laughs> say it alone. I, I fit in in that group. So <laughs> I would like to put up the background of the dogman behind me, but I don't have a green screen. We need to get you a green screen. I know that'd be kind of cool with the dog with the Bigfoot on your side and the dogman on my side. That would be neat. Yeah. Um, Awissa says, Meg, if you search those structure areas, sometimes you can find other small play structures that the young ones build. Interesting. Hmm. Anyway, um, yeah, the I think Taylor, Mississippi has my attention. Uh, I want to go there. Yeah. yeah. And and it's gonna happen. I mean, it's it's maybe an eight hour drive from here, which it's not much farther than LBL was. I mean, LBL was six hours um, and I'm going back to LBL. I'm, I'm definitely going to do that. Uh, I'm going to go back with a better camera, a dash cam and more time. I spent yeah. four days in LBL and feel like I just scratched the surface. Yeah, I definitely, I'm going to go up to LBL uh, and just a quick reminder, if you guys haven't 
uh, hit the like and subscribe button. If you're on uh, on the uh, YouTube channel or on any of the social medias, uh, hit like and or follow or subscribe, whatever it is. Hit the little hit the little bell so you get alerts, as that does help the channel grow and it also helps us uh, let you know every time we plan on going live. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to swing by the Patreon.com site, the patreoncom slash author, it's a great site. There are a lot of perks involved with the with the Patreon. Uh, which includes access to short stories that you won't, won't have access to anywhere else, um, the ability to actually help decide on book titles, uh, choose covers, uh, and help shape the future of the DA verse. Plus, um, and it'll help with doing things like what, I'm, what we're talking about tonight, going to some of these locations and filming and setting up and bringing them back for you guys. That is the whole plan. 100% of anything with the Patreon is going to go in to the books and the channels. That's, that's all it's for. Uh, Reservoir Dog says LinkedIn and subscribe, subscribe through Dixie Cryptid. Thank awesome. You. Thank you so much. Much appreciated. And Meg says, my friend was in Montana, said he saw Bigfoot. Another friend saw a creature 15 feet tall in North Carolina. Another saw a pair of red eyes. He told his friends to run in Oldwick, New Jersey. That is creepy. 15 feet tall in North Carolina. That is really tall for that area, isn't it? That's a big boy. Yeah. Um, could have come down out of the uh, at the Appalachians. Uh, reports in Alaska have them as, as high as 15 feet tall, and some of the ones out of out of different parts of Canada. It's really weird if you look at a sighting map uh, of mm -hmm. Bigfoot sightings, and uh, and I, I can't bring up the images right now for some stupid reason. I've got to figure it out once we're done tonight. But you notice it's a lot less reports coming out of Canada when you would think there would be just a crap ton, and then it realized that there are just huge chunks of Canada where nobody lives. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, they, they used to oh, joke in headless men. <laughs> yeah. The population of Canada is like Chicago. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, it's a little more than that. I know, but the, 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 there are just massive areas of Canada that are just completely unpopulated, which yeah. explains why there aren't as many sightings coming out of Canada. A little advice from werewolf. If you shoot, don't miss. That's a fact. Uh, and in a lot of cases with dog man, uh, they talk about them just shrugging off hits. Yeah. Um, and then I read another account, which I you know, would, which I would, uh, I bring up because I find it very interesting. Uh, there was a guy who kept having his his livestock killed. Uh, and I, this, I, I actually think this was near Taylor, Mississippi. Uh, I'll have to look and see if I can find the account. I've got it, got it from one of my one of my archives. I've got account archives on my computer. But anyway, this guy was having trouble with something stealing his livestock. So he started watching, laying in wait for it. Turned out it was a dog man. Uh, he shot it multiple times and it would shrug it off. Like he would hit it dead on with buckshot and it would like grunt or knock it knocked it down a couple of times, but it would get back up and run off with whatever animal it had. And it just kept coming back. Well, like a lot of old timers, he had reloading equipment. So he went down to his basement and he reloaded a bunch of shotgun shells with dimes that were older than 1963. So they're all made of silver. He put 15 dimes in each shotgun shell and put two shotgun shells into this thing's back from a double barrel shotgun and it stayed down. That was a lot. Yeah, 15, 30 dimes at a range of about 30 feet. Yeah, that did some damage. Uh, Josh Supposedly, says, he buried it somewhere on his property and won't tell anybody. All he wanted, to, all he wanted out of the situation was for it to quit killing his livestock. Yeah. And he hasn't apparently hasn't any more problem with him coming around after he dropped one. <laughs> uh, Josh says, "Large, heavily muscled apex predators will be super dense." And Which is exactly is why, in my Codename Wild Hunt books, they use large caliber rifles and handguns with heavy core rounds. Yeah, Meg said she's heard that story before. It's a great story. Um, and it's a firsthand, a firsthand account, the, the detail, the the level of detail, the guy gave even described the, the dog man's hands as looking very much like raccoon hands, uh, which I've heard in other accounts before, uh, the level of detail was awesome. And I firmly believe the guy did legitimately kill a dog man. Uh, but he wanted no recognition for it. He didn't want anybody coming to his land to dig it up. He won't say where he buried it. He just wanted to quit killing his livestock and that's what he got. So I can't fault the guy. Yeah. 
Well, Patty says, just don't turn it into shower curtains. <laughs> I actually went the shower curtain. I went the, the dog man on profile with the shower cap on. <laughs> That's the one I want. <laughs> Rubber ducky, you're the one. <laughs> Oh. I offered to to uh, put one of my one of my pictures on a shower curtain for my wife, and she's like, "Uh, no." <laughs> <laughs> I said, "I'll I'll try to position it so when, when you look at look out of the bathtub, it's like this much of my head sticking over." <laughs> that would be hilarious. <laughs> Didn't we have that with um, with the. Uh, um, Dark Angel Medical was <laughs> Yeah, we did. Well, I think we fixed that. <laughs> okay. Um, so we'll, we'll show a dark gateway. Well, actually, we should probably do that. We're an hour and a half in. I'll uh, go since you brought that up. I'll go ahead and and show that. Let me uh, switch over and see if that actually comes up because my intro the video did. Excuse me. Sorry about the belch, for the folks. That was that was coffee. Um, the intro video didn't come up. I don't know why. So we'll try the Dark Angel. Keep your fingers crossed. Have you uh, quick lead in on Dark Angel Medical? If you're unfamiliar with Dark Angel Medical, they it's a veteran-owned company that makes medical kits from all the way from first aid kits up to high-end trauma kits. As an officer, I carried a Dark Angel Medical kit for years, and I I wouldn't trust my life to any other kit. They also have what's known as the kit for life. If you use your kit to save a life, they will resupply the kit for free for life. Best kits in the business, bar none. Hey, everybody, this is Carrie Pocket Doc Davis from Dark Angel Medical, and you are listening to DA Ex Machina with DA Roberts. You may recognize me or some of my products from Dark Angel Medical in some of the Apex Predator, Lakeview Man, and Wild Hunt books, and you can get those products at www.darkangelmedical.com along with training classes on how to use those products and save a life. Shoot us an email at info at darkangelmedical.com and be the difference. Well, the video didn't come up on that either. I think it's the overlay. I, I, let me go try to change the theme. I think it's the current theme that's doing it. So let's just go to the basic black theme, apply it, and try that video again. Let me uh, bear with me, folks, while I play that video again to see if it actually works. I won't play the whole video. I just want to test it. Hey, everybody. Nope. Don't know. Then I have to talk to Josh. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I'm a techno idiot, so I don't know. I am going to put the theme back up, though, because I like it. Oh, man, really? Because I just changed it to black. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, hopefully I can get with Josh tonight and figure out what I'm doing wrong. Cause I know it's me. I mean, I, I, I know I did something and disabled something accidentally. So we'll have to, we'll have to figure that out. Um, I wonder if it's something I did when I was looking at it earlier, because I, I was, put, I'm the kid that goes into the doctor's office. And when the doctor comes in, I've got the ear thing in my ear and I'm trying to <laughs> do that. I touch everything. <laughs> do, doing your own reflex check. Like, <laughs> I've got the pressure cuff wrapped around my arm. <laughs> Doctor came in one time and I had two of those and was playing the drums because I was bored of those, those, uh, those yeah. like kick reflex uh, testers. I was like, do, 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 yeah. do. And the door opens and I'm like, hi, Doc. <laughs> I've always down. got all the drawers open. My doctor, <laughs> would, he used to tell his nurse, don't put her in there until seconds before I'm coming in or the entire room will be destroyed. I'm just terrible that way. So I, anyway, before we started, I was doing that. I was going through all of the, uh, the stuff and touching it. And I may have touched something wrong. <laughs> this one says, uh, Hey DA, your book covers are the best. I especially love, I especially love the apex predator and Lakeview man covers. Do you do, God, blah, blah, blah. do you use the same source for your book covers on or several different. Uh, all of my book covers are done by a book, a cover artist named Michael Fisher. He goes by the name Fish. Uh, he works for Jalington Ashton Press, uh, and he's he's done all of the covers, and he does an amazing job. So I will probably continue with him for the foreseeable future. Uh, Fish does a really good job, and I I love the covers. So I think we'll we're going to stick with a winning game here. So Fish, if you're listening, listening, love your work. 
<laughs> so then what's your next encounter or what's your next area? Oh, okay. Um, after Lockett Ranch, uh, the next one is uh, the Beast of LBL, uh, which uh, the the LBL videos aren't up yet on my YouTube channel, but the um, the Joe Bald video is. If you guys haven't had a chance to check out the Joe Bald video, definitely check that out. Uh, there's a couple of points where I think I've spotted eye shine that we didn't know was there. Uh, Josh and Adam are going to be going through it. Uh, and flagging sections of video and seeing what they can find. If you guys watch the video and at any point you see anything moving or, or like I shine that we didn't catch, leave a comment on the video with the time, uh, time index. And I'll have Adam and, and Josh tear into it and see what they can find. Cause those, those guys are the video guys. I, uh, I can barely say video shop, let alone know how to use it. <laughs> I'm just an uneducated hillbilly from Lebanon, Missouri. Hi. So LBL. LBL. Um, uh, to cover, a, we we done, we've done a couple of a couple of shows on LBL, but basically the 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 most famous attack in LBL happened in the early eighties. Most mostly, they believe uh, most accounts say nineteen eighty two, where a family of four who was just getting to the campground, starting to set up their camper, were attacked and killed. Uh, all four of them were ma were mauled, and the the little girl who was was around four years old was found 30 feet up a tree and having been fed on um the lbl story is pretty pretty horrendous uh and there are a lot of dogman stories around lbl the really weird thing about lbl is just across the ca the canal like a quarter mile from the north end of lbl People will not talk about it. I talked to a bunch of people and basically got stonewalled and even thrown out of one one store. Uh, <laughs> well, I was very politely thrown out. You can go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, he didn't tell me to get out. You know, he wasn't really rude. He's like, "You can go. Have a good day." Like, oh, get up then. I guess yeah. Uh, I guess I wasn't. I guess I'm done shopping. Uh, so uh, I took my cues. But the funny thing is, is. We had originally booked the the condo we stayed at. Uh, if you're ever going to be anywhere near LBL, stay at the Green Turtle Resort. It is really cool. I liked it. It's right on the right on the water. Our condo was so close to the water. We sat on our deck and threw bread to the the ducks and stuff. I mean, it, it was right. It was right there on the water. A uh, really cool little place. Got some good restaurants in it, and that's where I want to stay when we go back. But we had only originally booked it for two nights. Uh, so I could be there three days, two nights. But we decided to stay an additional day. And since the condo was already booked, we had to stay somewhere else. So we spent the third night in Paducah, Kentucky, uh, which is about 20 minutes away from LBL. Um, nice area. People in Paducah, however, know the legend and will talk about it. For some reason, the people in Grand, uh, in Grand, in Grand Rivers will not at all. Really weird. Uh, another weird thing about LBL is I, after from with four days of me running around the north end of LBL, I never saw a single animal. Not one. Not roadkill. Not squirrels. Not deer. Nothing. But around our condo on the other side of the canal, there were there were turtles. There were birds. There were was waterfowl. There, there were deer. We actually saw deer in the area of our of our condo. Uh, not a thing just across the canal. Nothing. In four days, not one animal that I saw driving all those back roads at the north end of LBL. That weirded me out. Because I, I spent a lot of time in the woods, and you always see something. Squirrels. Uh, you, you might run into rabbits. Uh, you know, you're always going to see something. Nothing in the north end of LBL. Not a thing. Really weird. Meg says, saw that video, think I will watch it on my tablet to see better details. If you see anything, you know, definitely, definitely let us know because okay. we're still going over it ourselves. The LBL videos will probably be up in a day or two. Josh says, and Meg, I'll get backpack soon. <laughs> <laughs> He's been working on it. Uh, Teespring has not exactly been cooperative. We'll, we'll, we'll put it that way. She says, no worries. <laughs> While I, I do like Teespring for certain certain reasons, I may end up moving the store because Teespring is 
not good about some other, about other things. So we'll we'll just see. Um, ultimately, I don't know. I may end up having more than one online store. Who knows? Yeah. Because I like some things about Teespring, but they don't do certain things. So long yeah. story. But LBL we touched on, and there are a lot of accounts in and around LBL that aren't the they, that family attack. Uh, there was a guy near LBL that found a dog man trying to get through his dog door one night. I, uh, yeah, I've seen yeah. That. Uh, there are people that have been chased back to their cars. Uh, there's an area that in LBL. It's an old abandoned. It used to be a hotel years ago before the Tennessee Valley Authority flooded those lakes, uh, and they call it Hotel California now because it's just it's just wreckage of a hotel and you can still go there. Uh, and it's not far from the road. You can, you can hike to it pretty easily, but there were some people that were exploring hotel California. that got chased back to their car one night. A uh, lot of accounts in LBL, uh, very, very, very active dogman area. In fact, according to Jody cook from the North American Dogman project, there are more dogman accounts coming out of LBL than anywhere else in the United States. Reservoir Dog says, DA, just wanted to compliment you on your Steve Lilly story on Dixie Cryptid. It was awesome. Didn't want to interrupt you. You don't have to interrupt the live show, but I had to say it. Thanks. Well, you know, that, that's the beauty of a live show. We can stop talking at any time we want. I appreciate the comment, and I'm glad you liked the story. I had a lot of fun writing it, and I will be writing another one before too terribly long. Cam's working on one, too, that'll that'll have elements of the wild hunt in it as well. So going to be some future projects that we're going to have a lot of fun with. That's really cool. I love that crossover stuff. Me too. Yeah. That story about the dog man coming through the dog door. That one really scared me. It, um, I can't even imagine what it'd be like to be coming down the stairs and look at your door. <laughs> yeah. <there's> a, <laughs> but I, I would have taken the opportunity to try to cut its head off. I mean, but that's yeah. me because I'm I, vicious that way. I don't know if it was actually trying to squeeze through or was just trying to reach the dog. Uh, uh, we, you know, we don't know what was going through its brain, but. Um, yeah, it, you know, you you find you find something like that sticking through your dog door. That's that's a, a clear indication that come next morning, I'm taking some long screws and putting boards over that that, that dog door. <laughs> Fido's going out on a leash whenever I take him out. No. Next morning, I'm putting a sign out in my yard that says "For sale." <laughs> For sale. Make offer. Yeah, house will be empty. You can just have it. <laughs> See so and so at the bank to assume yeah. payments. But I mean, was the dogman going here? Yeah. <laughs> here, kitty, 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 yeah. kitty, kitty. <laughs> here, kitty, kitty. Exactly. So, what's your next place? Next place on the list is well, this actually happened in 2008 on a Greyhound bus in Canada. It was a Wendigo account. And there's a there's a Wendigo, there's a version of the Wendigo they call Wendigo Psychosis. The Native Americans believe the spirit of the Wendigo could possess people. And this may, may very well be an incident where that happened. Uh, inexplicably, for reasons nobody knows, uh, a guy named Vince Lee, he was, uh, he was a Chinese Canadian citizen, he was of Chinese descent, uh, got on the Greyhound bus and on the Trans Canada. A highway at some point there was a young man named tim mclean on the bus and tim fell asleep and for reasons nobody may ever know uh mr lee took a knife out and he cut his head off and then started eating pieces of him um they found him not com not competent to stand trial and he was locked in a mental institution and i think he's out um if i remember the article i read but that they that was where they first started really using the term Wendigo psychosis. Um, but a lot of the Native Americans in the area believe he was possessed by the spirit of the Wendigo. And when they found the guy, he had strips of the guy cut off and filleted in Ziploc bags in his pocket. Oh, my. Yeah. When, no known reason whatsoever why he just decided to start eating this dude. But, you know, he was being logical. He took leftovers. Yeah, he had a doggy bag. That's right. <laughs> Facebook user says that would be scary too if a dog man uh, want to come into my apartment through the cat door. Yeah. Or your your cat walks in and looks around, and this arm goes, and the cat goes backwards back through the door. 
<laughs> Josh says, respect uh, with respect to the question, what is Steve Lilly doing during Ragnarok? Ragnarok, I can never say that right. Um, I'm gonna guess him and him and Lewis and and everybody are playing a rousing game of knock down the zombie. <laughs> Meg wants to know: Do you ever go to Dogman Encounters? Uh, I used to listen to that one. Um, haven't so much in recent years. I don't listen to as many podcasts as I used to. Uh, and, and that's not because I don't like them anymore. It's simply because I spend most of my free time writing. Uh, I still will make time to listen to cams because sometimes they're mine, <laughs> but, uh, I, I like all of cams and there are a couple others that I listen to on occasion, but for the most part, I don't listen to near as many podcasts as when I was on patrol. Uh, if I'm, if I'm at home, well, I'm home full time now because of a back injury. Um, and I'm basically just a full time writer. Um, so if I'm on the computer, I've probably got music on and, uh, and I'm writing. I mean, I'm, you know, I might throw on, you know, an, an entire, an entire collection of somebody on iTunes and just veg out, listening to music and put as many words on paper as I can. So I have, I used to listen to Dogman encounters, but not so much anymore. Uh, Werewolf says have not been able to get the, we're going for tacos t-shirt in black, man. I love that shirt. <laughs> yeah, I want one of those shirts too. I need to order one. I haven't ordered one yet. Josh, are those up? Um, I hope so. Facebook user says that's not funny. I don't know. <laughs> Pretty much all of it. You know, if you can't laugh at it, you're going to die anyway. I think the thing it's not funny about the you know pulling the cat backwards through the door. <laughs> I uh, I would be like. Holy crap. I can't believe that just happened. Uh, of course, I'm not going to open the door. Have you ever seen the <laughs> Einstein Awards? Uh, no, I've seen the Darwin Awards, but I'm, I'm sorry. The, the Darwin Einstein. Awards, the Darwin Awards. You're right. Have you seen those them? are awesome. Yeah, my goal in life is to be on the Darwin Awards. So I want to win the Darwin Award. My favorite Darwin Award recipient was a guy out in, I think it was Arizona. Arizona or Utah, he went to a military auction and found an old Jado bottle, which jet assisted takeoff that they mount to the wings of like C-130s to help them lift. And he bought one and he's like, hey, I'm going to put this on my car and see how fast I can get it going. <laughs> and apparently, <Wiley> coyote. <laughs> yeah, apparently at 300 plus miles an hour, he melted the brakes trying to stop. <laughs> and they found what was left of his car embedded in the side of a Mesa. <laughs> What what would possess you to think mounting a Jado bottle to your car and cooking it off is a good idea? <laughs> there is no kid, oh. kids don't do what the cartoons do. I've Ooh. seen Wiley e. Coyote strapped Ooh. a rocket to his back. Did he paint? Skates. I hope he painted Acme on the side. <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> that would have been hilarious. He should have. <laughs> Can you imagine the highway patrolman at the side of the road going? <laughs> And then looks at the the the, the read out and goes, "Well, I ain't catching that. <laughs> I don't even know how to call it in. I get on the radio like dispatch. I've got a. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I'm not even sure what color it was. Where was well, this? what did you hear? I heard." Ah! <laughs> Brief moment of a really bad smell. <laughs> Found the guy locked to the steering wheel with this expression frozen on his face. <laughs> oh, werewolf said, of course he was coming through the dog door. <laughs> <laughs> but he was reaching for a doggy bag. Yeah. Or maybe the dog. <laughs> or maybe the guy. Um, Josh missed the question. Uh, it was about the uh, the the Darwin Awards. Oh yeah, <laughs> I love the Darwin Awards. The my Darwin Awards are hilarious. To die in a way that will get me on the Darwin Awards, I've just got to find something dumb enough to do. I, I once like. Go ahead. No, sorry. Go ahead. I, I, my husband says, "You know, you want to die with dignity." Nah, no, because I want people to laugh at my funeral. <laughs> Even if it means going to the side of a mesa and just looking at the hole. At 300 plus miles an hour in a 72 Impala. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> if you're gonna go, be a legend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was one I don't remember what it was, and I I would love to tell the story because it made me laugh so hard. But it was about a man and a rhinoceros, and. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I might be getting the wrong mental image here. Well, I do remember that he was at the wrong end. And his at the business was, end of a black rhino. And it was his death was due to to uh, suffocation by defecation. <laughs> but I don't remember the whole story, and I don't want to try to tell any more than that because I know I'd ruin it. Poor guy. <laughs> Buried under a ton of rhino shit. Basically, yeah. Poor guy. <laughs> yeah. I feel bad for him. Me too. Not that bad. Because he <laughs> had to be awful stupid to put himself in that position. But um, <laughs> oh. Oh. anyway, Werewolf says Hope Greyhound will not sell him tickets. I, I would say he's got a lifetime ban. <laughs> I would think so. <laughs> uh, he just got really upset when he found out they weren't serving a mid-transport meal. <laughs> Oh, shoot. And I'm lost on here. Honestly, I don't even know. <sighs> I got behind on my comments. I'm sorry. That's okay. You're fine. <laughs> I got to laughing too hard. <laughs> we're, neither, we're neither of us good at what, oh, good at this yet, so <laughs> we're still trying to figure it out. Put the two people on the show who are most likely to derail it. <laughs> well, if there's a way to screw something up, I'm probably going to find it. Me <laughs> yeah. and technology don't get along well. <laughs> oh patty i don't know what's happening at this point we we got way off of the topic of of sightings and i i can't even remember the last one what were we talking about we talked about the uh the wendigo psychosis where the guy oh yeah was, that's was right. eating his fellow passenger great <laughs> the greyhound tickets <laughs> oh <laughs> oh <laughs> um Reservoir Dog said Jim Carrey earlier trying to, trying get, to get out of the rhino. rhino. <laughs> yeah. Trying to climb into the wrong rhino. Right. <laughs> the, like, I thought Jim Carrey do it. I bet I can. <laughs> yeah, that's probably what it was. That, that's not a decoy. <laughs> no. That's a rhino. <laughs> Rhino's eating and goes. <laughs> <laughs> what was going on back there? Oh God! <laughs> I'm laughing so hard I quit laughing. Now I'm just hissing. <laughs> I'm just hissing. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Yeah. Uh, okay. Next, next one. On, next one on the target list is the, the Legend of Boggy Creek from Falk, Arkansas. That's the one that reeled me in. Yeah, 1971. Uh, the Ford family uh, were had just rented a house, and they started noticing a creature come around, coming around, and they shot at it a couple of times. And then, if you've seen the movie, there's one particularly hilarious scene where the guy's taking a crap and he's reading the magazine, and this hairy arm comes through. Uh, I'm pretty sure any bowel obstructions he had cleared right in that exact moment. <laughs> Bobby Ford. Yeah. That always yeah. bothered me. He was wearing a union suit. <laughs> Do you know, if you stop in that movie, if you stop as he's going up on the porch and it attacks him, you stop the the, the video at that point. You can see where the guy in the <laughs> mask has gone like this. <laughs> you can kind of see a little bit of his <laughs> Well, they made that movie on about a $75 budget. It was yeah, a great movie, don't get me wrong, but it was just a low-budget, independent production that they yeah. shot there in Falk, Arkansas, using locals. <laughs> and uh, there wasn't a real actor in the bunch. I mean, they were all no. just local folks. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it became a cult classic, and it's still a good movie. I still enjoy watching it. But the me production too. values were, were right on the level of, like, Kolchak the Night Stalker, <laughs> where, where, where the guy with no head... Uh, was like shoulder pads and the, the, a fake jacket. And you, when he, and the arm came out like middle of the chest and was like waving. Yeah. <laughs> I was said, I'm like, that's not a headless dude. What the hell? 
you know, sadly, I can, you know, hey, Travis Crabtree. Yeah. <laughs> Wait crab, a minute for The Crabtree is still down there. You can actually mm -hmm. go down there and run into him. Mm -hmm. The, the, um, I can't remember which crab tree it is. The one who, uh, he, he's the one who was, I don't remember if he's featured in the film or not, but he, he worked until he, he died just a few years ago to keep that going and to, you know, that became his obsession. But the interesting thing is he had never actually seen it. There is, a, years. there is a Bigfoot festival in Falk, Arkansas every year. Yeah. Maybe, I don't remember. I have to look it up. <laughs> yeah. If any of you guys, if you guys know, feel free to you know pop it up in the, in the chat, but we, um, there is a Bigfoot festival in, in Falk, Arkansas. It's a one day event, but apparently it draws quite a crowd. So maybe, uh, maybe me, you and Cam could meet down there and sell yeah. some books and some yeah, Dixie Crypty podcast shirts. And, do a little driving around while we're there. Huh, yeah. Yeah, do a little filming and see if we can't rustle us up a crab tree to interview. Absolutely. <laughs> Getting back off topic again, a Facebook user says, working at a hospital, I got to see the backroom x-rays <laughs> of the weird things people put in their bodies that supposedly um, <laughs> they I, I accidentally into. said on it. <laughs> that was the comment from the guy. I worked in a hospital. That was yeah. the comment from the guy with the light bulb up there. Oh, I just my. sat down. No, <laughs> no, you, no didn't. you didn't. You had to make an appointment for that. <laughs> that was not accidental. Josh is saying that you're like Alan Grant on Jurassic Park. He can't get too close to technology. <laughs> he wrong. The look on my, my youngest son's face, the first time I asked him how to do a screen capture on my phone was mm -hmm. something like this. Like <laughs> the 30th time I asked him, it was like, seriously, dad, you still don't know. I'm like, I don't do it very often. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I, I can't do it. I suck at technology. You have to like swipe across or hold two buttons and swipe Stand up. Stand on one foot. It's got to be under a, a horned moon on the third Thursday. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. something crazy. Yeah, I agree. I used to be the, the tech person that everybody went to. And the older I get, the more I turn to my grandkids. <laughs> yeah, I just I call my I call my youngest son and my middle son tech support. Yeah. I'm like something's broke. <laughs> like, what'd you do, Dad? Oh I clicked the button and it don't work no more. Move. Not my job to fix it. You gotta figure it out all by yourself. <laughs> and no, my youngest son Noah's is like, move. Well, I'll fix it. <laughs> what did you do this time, Dad? Like, oh, it was working fine, and now it's not working fine. <laughs> My husband's like Alan Grant. He's like that, too. He can't. I don't trust him to touch his own computer, much less mine. Hold two. Oh, here you go. Yeah, I, I, I understand that, buttons. but I do it so rarely. I'm just like, which yeah. two buttons do I need uh -huh. to, like... Stand on one foot, close the close my right eye, make an offering to the sun god. I don't know. At our house, I am a um, Android person, and my husband is an iPhone person. And iPhones don't have two buttons to hold. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know how to operate my phone. When he hands me his phone, I'm like, <laughs> "Good luck. I'm not touching that thing." You know it's bad when they want they want you to do a screen cap of something. So I bring it up on the computer screen, then get my phone out, and I'm like, "Okay, now I got a screen cap." <laughs> there you go. You call your kids tech support. Patty calls hers deductions. I call mine felons. My my sister calls her mama's felons, and I'm like, "Yeah, that's a good one for my kids." <laughs> I, I used to refer to them as the nerdlets. <laughs> In reference to the re uh, legend of Boggy Creek, Werewolf mm -hmm. says he still can't poop by a window. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. I can't either. <laughs> you ain't wrong, man. <laughs> you ain't wrong. <laughs> I am. I am right there with you. If my bathroom has a window in it, I board it up. I can't. It's like going camping and having to take a crap in the woods somewhere. You're like, I swear to God, if something hairy reaches around this tree. <laughs> uh, Meg wants to know what I write about. Um, I write horror. I like to scare people. I like um, Dogman. It's my favorite subject at the moment. 
I like to write. Uh, I don't like, let me correct this. I have a fascination with serial killers, but I do not have a fascination with slasher films. So my books tend not to be slasher type. They tend to be either cryptids or paranormal. Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm not writing horror, I write books that have a lesson at the end. I don't write happy endings. Uh, there's nothing happier or tomorrow's a better day to anything I write, even if it's not horror. I just don't. Um, it's like lesson learned is what I guess I write about. Or, oh, look, there they go. <laughs> They're going to die. I, and so, I had a joke there, but I'll I'll refrain. That's okay. You can go ahead and say it. No, no, it's it's kind of crude. Oh, okay. Well, the won't. happy endings? Yes. <laughs> it'll just cost extra. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Love you. Long time. Real <laughs> <cute>. <laughs> Uh, Facebook user says the Wichita Bigfoot Festival in Mena, Arkansas, is September 24th through 26th. That would be cool. Also, how do I? Uh, okay, I'm not seeing the whole thing. Okay, do you? Uh, here you go. Uh, also, how do I get my name up instead of the Facebook user showing? I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, that might be a question for Josh. Um, I know on StreamYard how to do it, but I haven't figured it out on this yet. We're still we're still learning this. I, I promise I will figure it out before the next stream, which is Saturday. So I have a very short window to figure it out. But you probably are going to have to go to melanapp.com slash Facebook or something very similar to that and then authorize it. But I don't know if that's actually it. So um, I'll have to find out. Uh, Meg says she likes serial killers. Where can I read your books? In my computer. <laughs> she has not published them yet. And she no, should. I've, I totally I've think you should. Well, I've written eight books completely. Um, had my computer crash. And I know people are like, thumb drives, thumb drives. So back when they crashed, my computer crash, it would have been floppy disks. And it was hard to put. You couldn't put one book on a floppy disk. <laughs> it took a couple. Um I, since I, I had went through a really long mourning period because losing those books was like losing children. Oh, God, yeah. And I couldn't, I try to write and I thought, you know, this feels like I'm trying to replace my babies and I just can't do that. So um, I only in the last five years have started writing again and I've got three more books. None of them are complete. I've got a lot of short stories. I like to put them out. Um, I'm into what do they call the flash stories? The like the two paragraph flash fiction. Yeah, I love that. I love to do those. Um, but you'll have to find those on. They they just pop up everywhere. They're not on any specific site, I guess. But um, this one that I'm writing now is a dog man story, and I'm hoping to have it done in the next week, and um, then it'll go to editing. And then it'll be revised and <clears throat> then it'll go through the printing process. And I'm hoping it'll be out and ready to go by the 1st of October on the market. And when it does, I will announce it here and on Dixie cryptid and awesome. it will be known that it's out. It's just that I want you to know, Meg, I am not the writer that DA or cam are. I just am not. So don't expect it to be the greatest story ever written well <laughs> don't kind of don't sell yourself short you <laughs> might knock it out of the park i'm looking forward to reading it and i want an autographed copy oh you'll get one <laughs> no doubt about that you and cam both <laughs> but uh, yeah that's that's the story of my writing i do better helping other people well you did a great job editing my book well thank you that was yeah. all you did a really good job and that was fun other than the visual i got on roger that was really fun <laughs> i will try not to do that again that way you don't need mental bleach when you're no, done, no. done editing <laughs> no i i really didn't no he, he's a great guy i shouldn't tease him so much but um oh meg i promise you i'll let you know when it's available she says cool i want to buy it i do not care neoma i do not compare Ah. That's great. 
that. Never, never compare yourself to other other authors. All you can be is you. I mean, I, I, you you could give me every detail of a story and have me write the story, and it would not be your story. It would be my version. Mm-hmm. So only only you can write your stories, and you know nobody can t- nobody can have your voice. You know, that's why when I did the Steve Lilly story, I had to do my own version of Steve Lilly because I can't write Steve Lilly the way Cam does. That's and true. I, I, I went into that knowing that. Um, Facebook user says, what about Roger? Will he get a copy too? <laughs> if he wants one. Um, and Josh, yes, absolutely. Where did you go? Um, Josh says, hopefully Neoma will edit my book. Absolutely, I will. So I'm already counting on you getting it done. Well, hopefully I've managed to send some business your way because I've been giving your name to a lot of folks. Good. Yeah. Well, I've got um, Steven and. and, um, He's awesome. Yeah. That's why I was asking him about those stories because we we already kind of cut a deal on it, but I haven't seen him yet. So speaking of Steven, that's another place I would like to go to film. There's a there's a mountain in 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 uh, in Scotland where they have a creature they call the gray man which is basically Scotland's version of Bigfoot. And I want to go there. <laughs> Meg says, I tried uh, years ago to write, did once, 12 chapters, never tried again. Uh, just remember that um, <clears throat> Harper Lee only got one book out. She actually got two, but the second one is that we're talking about. She only got one good book out in her lifetime. So if you want to write a book, you should do it. Um, and... Um, Meg wants to know what Josh's book is about. And I can't answer that. I don't know. Um, uh, Josh Josh likes paranormal stuff. So I I, I, I think uh, I'll, I'll leave it to Josh to explain when, when he comes on. As I don't want to let the cat out of the bag or describe it wrong, yeah. uh, but I think uh, I think you know you I think you'd like it. Josh Josh is definitely going to be doing some horror too. Uh, Werewolf says the human brain is capable of great evil. I like serial killers also what goes wrong in the head in their head yeah i uh, i actually have favorite serial killers which is kind of scary to say but um my sister's convinced i am a serial killer i don't know why she thinks that but um maybe it's all the bodies in the basement she's read some of my work <laughs> i've but, i've got uh, a story i've been kicking around for a while about a serial killer that i haven't fully ri- fully written yet i've been doing notes on it here and there and i tend to create my characters and form give them like a little bio so i know this character in my head uh i call this guy the calendar killer and uh, it would become obvious once you read the book uh but i call him the calendar killer and having created that character I now once in a while have really weird dreams about him. Yeah. Like he's almost telling me to write the damn story already. And it's really weird. And it creeped my wife out when I told her, she's like, have you read the dark half by Stephen <laughs> King? I'm like, yeah. She goes, that's what you're sounding like. I'm like, well, I don't hear birds. And I never but, had like a unformed twin removed from my skull or anything like that. So it's by totally the, way, different. Um, the Facebook user that said about Roger, I believe that he says I'm Roger's brother. Is that oh, least? okay. So, and that's Louis Noriega. Then. Uh, Louis, I'm sorry, I thought yeah. it was Louis. Okay, um, and then Roger says that his book is a, it's a Bigfoot story, kind of a hybrid. Um, I I have to say that about mine too. It's a dogman story, but there's a serial killer in my book. So, um, yeah. and then it says uh, Josh Dalton says <laughs> DA goes to Scotland, got to buy a great Claymore sword when he gets there. You can bet it. The, the, the interesting part is going to be explaining it to customs. <laughs> Sir, you cannot take that on the plane. <laughs> Hell, there ain't room to swing it. What do you mean? Yeah. I'll be painting <clears throat> half my face blue and telling them I'm William Wallace. I'm William Wallace. You will not take my sword. <laughs> and Josh, um, Josh Jones further says, uh, I thought I put it on there. I didn't. Uh, but it plays into human rationalizing, too. That's interesting. I'm looking forward to editing that one. And it says uh, the Bigfoot is a hybrid with something else. Ooh, I had a great thought for an alien story, <clears throat> um, for a zombie story. I've never written zombie, but I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if the zombies were actually because there are aliens above the Earth's atmosphere that are fighting? And 
the first zombie is actually an alien that died and, and came to earth and there's something in the earth's atmosphere that causes it to resurrect and then it attacks somebody and that causes them to resurrect and so patient and then, zero is an alien that's kind of cool that's yeah. a different take yeah but i couldn't go any farther than that because i don't uh, the alien the uh zombie genre i'm not comfortable enough with um meg says josh that sounds very good so yeah i think i agree i think it does too um <laughs> there's here's how you get it home you mail the sword to yourself that would probably be the smartest yeah. i'd probably purchase it and ship it to my own address yeah but if, if I go, to, if I go to Scotland, I'm not coming back without a kilt and a sword. That's just not happening. <laughs> you got to wear the kilt to Taylor, Mississippi, and I will oh, come with the camera. <laughs> oh, you know. Get you up in the bucket truck. <laughs> <laughs> That's a sight nobody wants to see. Oh, the dog man might like it. You never know. The, even the dog man's going to go, oh, God. <laughs> heart, 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 heart. It runs away. Oh, <clears throat> Patty said, and I mean, I'm not going all oh, because it's La Llorona's, but it says, DA, I still want to be La Llorona's prima. That's funny. I am okay. going to do a La Llorona story, but it's it's down the road. I've got a lot of projects between here and there, but it's coming. It is coming. It's I just uh, down the road. I've got a lot, a lot of projects. I've, I've got enough books already plotted out and ready to start writing to keep me busy for probably the next 18 months. Wow. That's pretty cool. Hopefully, hopefully everybody likes all of them. That is the plan, anyway. So, what's our next? Uh, we we were at Boggy Creek. The next one is Port Chatham, Alaska. All right. Uh, the first disappearance in Port Chatham, Alaska, when they first started building the the uh, b building the, the the town there, uh, was in 1931. Was a logger by the name of Andrew Camluck. Uh, he was. They found him dead at his logging site and something had picked up a massively heavy uh, piece of logging equipment and beat him to death with it. It, it, was, it wasn't something people could pick up. It was bigger uh, than a person could lift. Yeah, it was bigger than a person could lift and he had been clubbed to death with it. Uh, they found him dead and then they had a lot of other people go disappearing. Um, then there was a, a hunter named, named Simeon Kavasnikov. Simeon. I'm pronouncing Simeon and he just vanished without a trace. They never found it, never found a sight of him. Um, when they started settling Port Chatham, excuse me, the ground, the uh, waters off Port Chatham were rich with fish and they still are. Uh, you can still, you know, take a boat into that area off the Kenai Peninsula and, and fish, you know, fish all day and catch tons of fish. Uh, the, the fishing grounds were so good. They built the town there so they would have a close port to where they could take the fish and have them processed. So they built a cannery there. So through the 1930s and into the early 1940s, this cannery was shipping fish products everywhere, all over the world. You know, boats would come in, they'd load them up with cans of fish, and they'd send them out. So the town is making good money. The cannery is, is flourishing. There are plenty of people that are moving into the town to work the cannery. And the fishing grounds are stable and still are to this day. Having said that, People would go out into the woods to hunt deer because not everybody wants to live off fish. Um, I don't like fish, so I would, I would definitely be hunting deer. But people would go out and either not come back or they would find pieces of them. Uh, sometimes they would find like legs or feet or even a head floating down the streams that were coming back out of the woods. And sometimes they, out into the bay. And, you know, and floating out into the bay. Or sometimes they found nothing at all. People disappeared without a trace. Then workers from the cannery started reporting large, hairy creatures coming into the town at night and trying to get into houses. Uh, so it got bad enough that the people that worked at the cannery refused to work until the, the cannery did something about it. So they hired professional hunters to try to stop the threat, and they disappeared. Um, so people just left the town in droves. They left it to the point that they abandoned the town in the late 1940s. When Bigfoot attacks are so prevalent that they will abandon a town, they're bad. 
the ruins of Port Chatham are still there. There's still relics of the cannery. There's still some of the structures are still kind of standing. They're they're falling apart, obviously, uh, but most of it's have been reclaimed by the woods. And even to this day, the natives in the area tell people don't go there. I think the cannery was actually in Port Lock. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, right. It, but it's all right there, close by. Yeah, but Port Lock also is abandoned. It, mm -hmm. it went down overnight, just like uh, Port Chatham did. It was on the same peninsula. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in fact, yeah, Res Reservoir Dog said, wasn't there two towns? Yeah, yeah. Port Chatham and Port Lock. Yeah, and uh, I saw another one here. Um, this is going back. Werewolf says, aren't all dogmen serial killers? Yes, they are. But not all serial killers are dogmen. <laughs> That's true. Well, I, you know, and if the dogmen, I don't know. Anyway, um, Meg wants to know if they're like um, the Gugway in Alaska. In Alaska, they refer to it as the hairy man. And it has a long history of carrying people off. And what, what we're noticing with, with Bigfoot uh, creatures, especially the ones on the northern climbs, the farther north you go and the colder it gets in the wintertime, the more they rely on meat. Uh, and much like, look at bears, okay? You've got black bears that range all the way down to southern parts of the United States. And they're mostly, they mostly eat berries and roots. And they, they will supplement with their diet with meat, but it's rare. Usually they're, they're foragers, okay? Attacks by black bears are very rare. They do happen very once in a while, but attacks on people by black bears are very rare. You get a little farther north, you run into the range of the grizzly bears, Grizzly bears are omnivorous. They will eat meat if the opportunity presents itself. Uh, they seem to prefer it because it's high in calorie, but they will eat berries and roots and anything else they, that, that wanders in their way. Uh, and they're a little more aggressive toward people. Uh, you catch a grizzly bear in a bad mood or hungry, and you're definitely on the menu. Attacks on humans by grizzly bears are not that uncommon, especially if you live someplace like Alaska or, 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 um, you know, Montana or someplace, even even up in Canada, attacks on humans by grizzly bears are not that uncommon, uncommon, especially in the leaner months when they're, they're gearing up for hibernation. Now, go a little farther north and you run into the polar, bear, polar bears. They exist solely on meat. Fish and whatever else they can hunt. Seals, uh, the occasional slow, uh, slow uh, Eskimo. Uh, if, it's, if it's made of meat, they're going to eat it. Uh, so you can see the trend there. The colder the climate, the more they rely on heavy proteins to, to exist. And I think the same thing happens with these Bigfoot type creatures. The farther north you get, the more they are going to exist mostly on meat, if not completely on it. So the ones up in Alaska are, are, are definitely meat eaters. Uh, they've lots of reports from hunters of them stealing kills, moose and elk, either dragging it off or just carrying it off. Um, there have been reports of fights. Hunters have seen fights between grizzly bears and Bigfoot, and the Bigfoot comes out on top. Um, so, you know, they, they, they're they definitely a dangerous animal. Um, so I think the farther north and the leaner you get, the more aggressively meat eater, the more, more aggressively uh, carnivorous they are. Uh, and I think that explains the disappearances in Alaska, uh, especially around the Port Chatham area, because that is, it's still a cold climate. It's Alaska. Uh, and I, I don't necessarily think they're all Gugway, but I think you find the Gugway a lot more in northern climates uh, because they, they're primarily meat eaters and they're very aggressive. Uh, they also tend to be on the bigger side, like 10-foot range. Uh, on Alaska, reports run all the way up to 15 feet. And some, there, of course, there's been some that, that you know wildly speculated to be even taller don't know. I'm not disputing the, the the account. I'm not saying anybody's wrong. I will not be the guy that disputes anybody's anybody's sighting. Uh, whether your experience is with, you know, seeing one go through a portal, mind speak, whatever your whatever your encounter, I believe your count your encounter. I'm I'm gonna I'm not gonna dispute it. I'm not gonna say you're wrong. I'm not gonna say you made it up. I'm not that guy because none of us know what these things are capable of. We, you know, until they're even proven to exist, we're not going to be able to to, to, to to debate that. So I don't think if somebody believes one way and I believe another, 
about the way Bigfoot behaved. I don't think that means we have to not like each other or argue over it. Uh, their, their, point, their point of view is just as valid as mine. Anything is possible at this point. We don't know. It's all theories until it's proven. Uh, well, there's a lot of obser observations been made through firsthand sightings, and we can gain a lot of information by reading these encounters, which is what I do. I pour a lot, I pour, a, I pour over encounters a lot, um, and I know how my my personal opinions lean. But again, I'm not going to be the guy that disputes anybody's anybody's encounter or anybody's experience. Um, you know, if that if that happened to you, you know, by all means, that's your that's your account, and you know, you. I, I, I back you 100%. We don't know. We just don't know. So I, I don't want to see anybody wasting time arguing with each other over differences of opinions over cryptids because we don't know. Uh, until we do know, there's no point in arguing because anybody could be right. Anybody could be wrong. We don't know. And I something else I want to point out is no matter what television tries to sell you, or what other people at, 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 at uh, Bigfoot, Bigfoot uh, conferences or anywhere you go, there are no experts on cryptids. True. Uh, and they call it the Nantinook, I think is the word in the Alaska. Nantinook. Yeah. Um, by the way, Rez says we can call him Rez and awesome. uh, says that I really like your channel, guys. Awesome. So, Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> Patty. Yeah. Harry Man is kind of boring but it, the last the allusion word is is nantinook n-a-n-t-i-i-n-a-k or uk i can't remember which i now. think it's uk but i i don't i don't remember off the top i'd have to look it up yeah uh, if you look at every every tribe in north america has their own name for it i mean you know look at a the, the lakota call it the chietanka Mm -hmm. Every tribe, even tribes that did not have any communication with each other whatsoever, have a different name to describe the same creature. Mm -hmm. that, Roger, that, that's the biggest way to lead, lend credence to the fact that it's out there because so many Native Americans were detailing similar accounts from different parts of the country long before any European settlers set foot here. Roger Peacock says, from what I've heard, there are supposedly three different types of big of Bigfoot in Alaska. And I would be surprised if there's only three types considering the size of Alaska, but I'm sure that there are at least three. Well, the population density of Alaska, if you spread them out over the state, you would have one person for every square mile. Yeah. And most of that population is in the few cities in Alaska. So there are entire chunks of Alaska where the only human you might find is some homesteader that it can only get supply drops from an airplane. And Patty says, Oh good. Hopefully the ones in California are vegan. Yeah. I <laughs> keep saying that about they, Tennessee and Kentucky, but I don't think so. They got long hair and surf. They're like, bra, is, is it not made of tofu? I'm not eating it. <laughs> oh, shit. Surf for Bigfoot. <laughs> Makes Gonna catch direct. some waves. <laughs> Thank you, DA. That helps. Um, okay, I've lost my... my uh, do, 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 do. Here we go. Wolfman says, hi, DA and Neoma. This is just Wolfman. Sorry if I spelled your name wrong. Got it right. I missed a lot tonight. I'll catch up tomorrow. <laughs> no problem at all. We're just happy you're here. Thank you for joining us. <clears throat> Let me see. I think I, I think I finally caught up with them. I might have missed a few along the line, but if we did, I apologize. We 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 try not to catch them, and uh, not to miss them. Miss, miss them, but uh, sometimes we do. Um, and we'll, we're still figuring out things here on on uh, on Melon, but it, every show is a learning experience. Even when I was still on Streamyard, I learned something new every time. So I'll probably be learning things for the, for months on this. But uh, we each show hopefully will get a little bit better. And with you guys' help uh, and and you guys your support and and encouragement, you know, I hope you guys will join us for the future shows. And with with your help, it will get better each show. And uh, we've got a lot of topics. And I said this uh, last night on the short show we had. If you guys have any topics related to cryptids or books or anything like that that you would like us to discuss on on a show 
to do to base the show around, shoot me an email at da roberts at da roberts dot net, and tell us your 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 idea for a show. And if it's something we think we can do or have enough information on, uh, we may just do a show on it. And if you have your own personal encounter and you would like to come on the show and tell your encounter, you can contact me again at da roberts at da roberts dot net, and uh, we'd love to hear your encounter. And and if you don't want uh, to come on the show and talk the, uh, tell us your account yourself. You can email me the account and our lovely voiced Naoma Finn, who does narrations on what if it's true and Dixie cryptid will be more than happy to narrate it or I will do it either one, but, uh, we'll, we'll read your account on the air if you don't want to come on and read it and, and mention it and talk about it yourself. I'd so definitely, definitely. If you've got accounts and you want us to do it on the air, Send them to that email address, da roberts at da roberts dot net. Uh, back to um, Port Chatham. Mm -hmm. Do you know the story about the three hunters that were hunting the? And, and I was looking at something else. You might have shared this because I was looking up the name to make sure I got it right. Uh, but the three hunters that were up, they were hunting black bear and doll sheep, and a storm came in, and they wound up having to camp for three nights on on uh, dogfish lagoon bay and all three i think all three nights or at least the first two nights something kept walking around their tent they didn't see it in fact the second night they even got out of the tent and flashed the flashlight around and couldn't see anything but it was terrifying enough that the third night they got up got out of there <laughs> and, there's and, one account i read out of alaska and i've got to see if i can find this again uh, because it's a great account, and I would like to find the entire account and read the entire account on the air. But what basically happened was a bush pilot took an entire group of people out to a, to an elk camp and dropped them off. And on his way back, he saw a very large, like 10-foot-plus Bigfoot creature heading toward the camp, and he didn't think anything of it. He comes back a week later. The camp is destroyed nobody's there and he finds broken guns and, and empty shell casings everywhere. Like there was a battle and they never found any of the occupants of the camp. I'm sorry. I got, yeah, that is really crazy. I got wrapped up in, in, uh, in a comment here. I'm not quite sure where I'm going here. Which one? Uh, Josh said, uh, read all patty's comments or read all of patty's comments and i missed them because i was looking for something else and i don't know what patty said oh meg says it must have been something about the paranormal anyway i'm i should go up i should just i'm sorry i i kind of seen so many comments at this point um Oh, she said, uh, no, that was Josh Dalton, left the equipment for the cannery in place, correct? Yes, they did. They abandoned the cannery. Uh, and some of the, like, big generators and stuff can still be found, like a big big motors and things can still be found there on the shoreline. Oh, Josh was just giving Patty a hard time. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, there was a comment we missed. Um, it's from Rez. It's back to something about the LBL storyline. Back to LBL storyline. Here it is. It says, uh, back to the LBL storyline. Did you catch the story of the gentleman who said he was there during the murder of the family and escaped? It was a crypto, It was on Crypto Studies Institute. Yeah, I, I, I won't really comment on that too much, but um, his, uh, his, his story's pretty much been debunked. Um, several several people have come forward, and I I I I'm not gonna I, I'm not gonna talk about that guy too much. I don't really want to get into it because it's it's a can of worms. A lot, so a lot of people still believe the guy. A lot of people don't. Um, but me, from the standpoint of of a cop, his story had a lot of holes in it, and I didn't believe it. Um, just too many inconsistencies and he contradicted a lot of the things that were reported by people by a by a cop that was there um that one of the re responding officers and his, his his story just had a lot of holes in it that 
yeah, I, I like again, I don't want to go into into it too terribly much, but yeah, I'm familiar with the story, and I don't believe the guy. Yeah, I I won't go into it too much either, um, but I find it interesting that the ones who are least likely to believe the guy are the ones with the the what's the word I'm looking for? The strongest background in interrogation. Mm -hmm. And the ones who are most likely to believe him are people who are, have more of a romantic nature. And I don't mean like, you know, I mean, romantic nature in, in yeah. the truest form of romantic. So, um, it, it just, uh, it's unfortunate because it's it has caused quite a rift in the community. It did. And we have enough of them as Oh it is. god, yeah. Uh, which is exactly why I don't really want to go into it in in too, whole, in too much detail because I don't want I don't want to cause an argument nor do I want anybody upset with me. Uh well, I'll just say that my cop instincts basically picked up on a lot of inconsistencies and leave it at that. Yeah. But thank you for bringing it up. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Um, Rez says, thank you, DA. Good enough for me. <laughs> awesome. And, uh, okay. Anyway. Um, yeah. So what's your next one? Uh, the last one I have on the list is also in Alaska. It's an area referred to as the Alaskan triangle. Uh, you can Google Alaskan triangle and see the map. Uh, you can read some of the accounts. Uh, and yeah, I'm not going to say that cryptids are responsible for all the disappearances because I'm just not, you know, there are grizzly bears up there. There are people get trampled to death by moose. I mean, it happens. And there, there's just in the Alaskan triangle, when you look at population densities and based on numbers of population, more people per capita go missing in the Alaskan, Alaskan triangle than anywhere else in the world. They just, go into those woods and disappear. One of the most most famous incidents of somebody going missing in that in the Alaskan Triangle was in 1972. The US House Majority Leader Hale Boggs was flying over that area with the Alaskan Congressman Nick Begich. Their plane went down somewhere in the Alaskan Triangle. Over 100 aircraft and 30 more than 30 boats checking the shoreline scoured that area and never found a trace of the aircraft. And I'm not saying it was abducted by aliens. I'm not saying, it, you know, the Bermuda Triangle, it was sucked into a vortex because there are more than, I think, 70 planes that have gone down in the Pacific Northwest that they've never found. The woods are just that dense that an entire aircraft can crash through a, through a canopy and never be found. It, it just, that's how dense those woods are. And not, I'm not, and not all of the disappearances are, are easily, uh, easily explained. Some of them are pure straight out of missing 411 experienced and armed hunters, groups of hunters. You know, I can understand, uh, you know, if you've got six guys going out to hunt and a bear attacks, I can see the bear getting one or two of them, but they're all armed. They're going to eventually put that bear down. I mean, the guys in Alaska that hunt, they don't hunt with 22s. They're hunting with big boar rounds because they're they're hunting elk, they're hunting moose, they're hunting caribou. These are large animals that you know, you're not going to take down with a little tiny round. They hunt with big caliber bullets. So if it was a grizzly bear and it mauled one or two of them, the others would have killed it. Uh, somebody would have come back. We're talking groups of hunters that went into the woods and were never heard from again. That's not typical. That's not normal. Something happened out there to make experienced outdoorsmen who were heavily armed not come back. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm not saying 100% of the disappearances are cryptid related, and I'm not saying 100% of them are animal related. I'm just saying that people that shouldn't disappear go into those woods and never have heard from them again. Wolfman says it's, in it's interesting that aggression with Bigfoot creatures is met with aggression, but then there are stories of children being carried cared for or fed by teddy bears in the woods like they care for the weak. I think there again, I, I think that that's going to be depending on the personality. Um, 
or the species uh, because yes. there are just as many, especially when you look at the missing 411 cases, there's just as many small children who just gone without a trace. Like uh, a couple of kids, like one in Yosemite was a, was a toddler who was six feet away from his family. And they turned away for a second, turned back, and he was never heard from him again. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? They, found, they, they searched the area with dogs. Experienced tracking teams refused to track. Yeah. Why? You know, what's throwing these dogs off that they won't track it? Uh, that's got to be, uh, be something that scared the dogs because they would lay down and refuse to follow the scent. Um, and that's not in every case. Yeah, there, there are times do that dog teams have tracked. Uh, but I think that there's more than one species of these creatures. I think some are ambivalent, to say the least, towards humans. As long as we don't mess with them, they don't mess with us. And I think those are the incidents of creatures like that. If they find a child lost in the woods, they might care for it. Or they might even help get the, get the child home. There's been some accounts like one guy uh, was cutting wood and the tree fell on him. And a Bigfoot allegedly lifted the tree off of him and saved his life. There are accounts like that. There are dozens and dozens and dozens and probably hundreds and thousands of accounts that are 100% peaceful. But the ones that stick out in our mind, the ones that will always set our teeth on edge, are the dangerous accounts. And that's that's where my fascination lies. That's why I write about them. Yeah, there was a fireman uh, fighting a forest fire in Northern California who uh, reported being carried out of the fire. Uh -huh by a Bigfoot. They, there's definitely friendly encounters. Um, no doubt about that, but you're right. It's the scary ones that, that scar our, our imagination. Uh, somebody says, um, in 1944, a B-24 bomber got lost in the San Gabriel Mountains. It wasn't until 1975 that a couple of hikers found it. It took that long for somebody to find it. And I'm sure there was an extensive search done looking for it. That's yeah. just how dense some sections of the, of the wilderness still are. Here, here in the United States, we seem to have this, this almost smug attitude that we are the masters of everything, that we know, know every inch of the soil of the United States. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. Less than five miles from where I'm sitting, you can start getting into uh, to sections of of deep woods that lead into the Mark Twain. And there are places out like in Busick National Forest and Mark Twain National Forest where you could go and not see another human for days, if ever. There are dense sections of woods. And if you look at look at a Google map of the United States, just you know, do the do the Google Earth where you can see the the you know like terrain features, then scroll out until you can see the United States as a whole and you will see unbroken sections of green that lead for hundreds of miles. Then you've got areas along ma major river systems that are also surrounded by green. These are major highways for cryptids because they're places where people don't go or rarely go. And it's, it makes perfect sense to me why these creatures can move without being seen because we have so much dense woods still in the United States. Uh, we have not explored all of it. And Canada is even, even, even worse than us. I mean, there's entire sections of Canada where no human may have set foot ever. Patty says a family of three were missing and found dead yesterday in Northern California. Read that and article. The first thing I thought was cryptids. Yeah, that would, as I was reading that, I was thinking cryptids. That is a weird article. Mm -hmm. uh, they won't, they haven't listed, listed the cause of death. They mentioned something vaguely hazmat related, which I, to me smacks of BS because if something had killed these people that was hazmat related, it would have affected the people that found them. Um, I, and they have not released the cause of death. So it, there's something wonky going on with it. Uh, there are a lot of places that, that are just have evil reputations like crater Lake, uh, the area around Crater Lake has so many disappearances around it. Mm -hmm. there, and the, the natives that lived in the area referred to that place as a haunted place uh, and, not, and, and told people to, to avoid it. Uh, it's, you know, there's some creepy places in the United States. Thus, what we were talking about early in the show, you can look at plat maps and old maps of areas of the United States like 
if you got a plat map of Green County, there's probably a dozen places with something wild man, devil, or monster related booger holler. Mm-hmm. You, you, any area, any state you want to pick, and you look at detailed maps of the area, you're going to find oddly named places like Wild Man Creek and things like that. And I and I firmly believe that places got names like that because of something that happened there. You know, like like I was joking earlier, you don't walk up and go, "That's a beautiful natural spring coming out of that rock." Let's call it Monster Springs. <laughs> no. Why would you call it Monster Springs? <laughs> There's got to be a reason it got that name. Yeah. Werewolf 5674 says, is there a book on LBL? And I would recommend the author Barton Nunnally. Yes. Um, and I would start with the Inhumanoids. It's, um, he, re- he writes about Kentucky primarily. Mm-hmm. But he actually, that's not the first one. The first one that actually has the LBL incident, because I think he was the first one to report the family in the LBL. Uh, I can't think of the name of it. I just tried to look it up, and of course I couldn't find it. But uh, his name is Barton Nunnally, N-U-N-N-E-L-L-Y. And he writes about uh, cryptids in Kentucky, and um, he covers the LBL in his books. There are there are a few books out on the on the beast of LBL, uh, some really good, some not so good, uh, but you know you can kind of pick and choose which ones you like. And th- I would say the best one that I've read is the one Naomi men- mentioned. Barton Nunnally really does a good detail, a good uh, a lot of a good amount of research, and really digs into the meat of it. So you get a pretty good, a, a really good. Uh, investigation into the story uh jody cook who founded the north american dogman project who's also a big who was a a big time uh bigfoot uh, researcher as well uh actually spoke to one of the officers that responded to the lbl incident uh the guy was dying of cancer and basically came clean told told uh, told him the told jody the whole story that he was not supposed to tell he was sworn to secrecy on and he figured since he was dying he might as well tell the story and that's why jody cook didn't believe that witness that came forward because the witness was not mentioned by one of the officers that investigated it um yeah it's yeah barton nunnally's a, a good researcher anything by jody cook is is good um the North American Dogman Project did a video project on the Beast of LBL. And if you go to YouTube and look up North American Dogman Project, you'll find several of their videos. Uh, their LBL video is really good. Uh, and also Cloaked Hedgehog. I was uh, she's that. she's yeah. from Norway, I think it is. I love her accent, but Me she too. does she does a wonderful uh, version of the of the of yeah. the beast of lbl even i'd even talked to, to to jody and he said it's one of the better ones out there yeah if you look up cloak hedgehog the beast of lbl you will definitely get the best retelling well, of that story well check out her her entire channel because she talks she, about a lot of cryptids and she goes into detail in more into more detail about dogmen than most researchers do she she's got a multi-part ex- extensive maps too yeah on sightings yeah her site her recordings of, of uh, areas where she talks about dogman sightings are awesome mm-hmm. that lady has done some wonderful research yes she's she's one of my favorite sources i've listened to a lot of her stuff me too yeah so we've covered them all all the ones i had listed if you yeah. can think of any others to throw in we can but that's the ones that just came to me while i was making notes for the show um Well, back to the LBL, you know, Mm -hmm. LBL isn't just Dogman. The southern part has a lot of Bigfoot sightings. Mm -hmm. Exactly. There are a lot of Bigfoot sightings in the southern area. Um, The whole area around LBL is very densely wooded. Uh, In fact, when you look in LBL, LBL is 170,000 acres of unbroken forest. Um, Very few clearings in it. It's dense woods. And I can tell you from driving the North end and I drove all over the North end. I put a lot of miles on my van, but, um, I drove all over the North end and even driving down roads that I wasn't even sure my van would make it down because some of them are pretty rough. Um, that, that there's here in the summertime when the, when, when the woods are thick, I couldn't see very far back into the woods at all. 
And at night, it was like driving through a tunnel. You couldn't see anything. Once you it was off the road, you were done. You couldn't see back into the woods. Uh, and some of those roads, the tree canopy is so thick, it's like almost turn your headlights on it during the day. It's like driving through a tunnel. Um, very thick woods. And again, one of the weirdest things that still bugs me about LBL was not seeing any animals. Now, I know they do allow hunting, but experienced hunters will tell you don't hunt the north end of LBL. Uh, there are elk and buffalo in the south end of L LBL, but I, I didn't see a damn thing in four days. And that's that still just weirds me out that I didn't, uh, not even roadkill. I mean, you know, on the highway leading up to, to LBL, when we were still re driving into Grand Rivers, I was seeing like armadillos dead on the highway, the occasional possum, raccoon. I saw a couple of deer that had been hit along the highway. There was roadkill. Um, it's roadkill. You drive through Missouri, you're going to, you know, you're probably not going to drive more than a mile or two without seeing a dead animal that's been hit by a car, especially on like a highway like I-44 or 65, Interstate 65. If it's on an interstate, you're going to see see roadkill. It just happens. It's unfortunate, and I hate to see animals hit and killed like that, but it happens. You know, animals as big as deer. Mm -hmm. Inside LBL, nothing. Not one. And, and and I still I'm still trying to wrap my brain around that. It still kind of freaks me out. Yeah. So um, since you're in Missouri, why don't you tell us a little bit about Momo? Momo the monster. Momo the monster is the nickname that was that was coined in 1972 in Louisiana, Missouri, uh, when people started seeing a creature very much like Bigfoot. They described it as having more of a domed type head. Uh, which it seems odd to me. I don't think it's a different creature. I just think it was the way people were describing it. Uh, or it may have had more shaggy hair. I, I, I don't know. But I definitely think it was a Bigfoot type creature. Uh, I don't think it was a, a unique species to Missouri. But they around Louisiana, they still refer to it as Momo the monster. And around town, uh, quite a few people saw it. There was a couple out having a picnic. And apparently it... it crashed the picnic uh, probably smelled the food but they 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 had to dive in their car and get out of there uh there was a lady standing at her at her kitchen sink doing dishes that saw it walk into her yard uh they're just over the over the period of months in in louisiana missouri there were dozens of sightings of this creature and they actually formed together uh, essentially a posse of people with rifles and stuff you know a bunch of different a bunch of people got together and went looking for it and they never found it uh, but even to this day, there's still the occasional sighting of what they refer to as Momo the Monster near Louisiana, Missouri, which is just a sleepy little town on, and it's on the Missouri River, and it's 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 kind of in the middle of nowhere. But it's it's a neat area, and I want to go up there and do a video too. So there's a lot of places I want to go. How about there's a lot of places Springs? here in Missouri. Brown Springs. Mm -hmm. I would love to go down to Brown Springs. I am terrified of Brown Springs. That's one place I'm not sure I'd want to go. I'm not anymore. Why is that? I would love to have gone to Brown Springs before. Uh, uh oh. Apparently, I was listening to a podcast on the uh, uh, Bigfoot Crossroads with, uh, and it was had a uh, um, Kunbo and and uh, some of the other guys on there. Matt and Bear. Yeah, and Bear, and they were mm -hmm. talking how at Brown Springs they developed it. It's oh. a campground now. Oh, they decided to feed them outright, huh? They, yeah, they're hunting a baited patch now. <laughs> uh, but apparently they went in and bulldozed that entire area, and there's houses there and a campground. And I guess across across the river or the, whatever's right there in that area, mm -hmm. they said you can still hear the creatures, but they, there's nothing at Brown Springs because it's all lit up. That's one of the most terrifying stories I've ever heard, though, came out of there, of the young couple that was found. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and apparently they were caught or they they were killed in the act mm -hmm. it, they were they were doing what young couples do but apparently uh, they decided to do it on the hood of the car yeah uh, and from what the crime scene indication and, and reports have said uh something walked up uh and grabbed the guy and twisted his head around backwards and discarded him and some accounts say that the creature finished the job yeah and others just say it just killed her. Uh, but either way, it's it's disturbing. Um, yeah. 
but the Native Americans used to tell st stories of women being abducted as mates. So, yeah. There's a story of a, na uh, well, there's more than one, but there are stories of, of women who have wandered out of the woods three years later. And then there's the one who came out pregnant mm -hmm. and died giving birth, but apparently the baby survived. And uh, so, yeah. Well, that, that, that tells you, that tells you right there that there, if that story is legit, it's a, it's a hominid. Yeah, it's it's not, it's not an ape. It's close enough to be genetically compatible. Mm -hmm. And we know from the Russian scientist experiments that, uh, that Joseph Stalin signed off on back during right after world war II that humans and chimpanzees won't DNA won't cross because mm -mm. he tried artificially inseminating female chimpanzees with human sperm and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not close enough genetically for it to work. Um, he tried it again with with uh, he was going to try it again with orangutans and his funding and funding got a, got tanked and he got arrested before that happened. But he would have been actually better off using the chimps because they're closer to us than than orangutans are. But if that's true, that Native American women had been abducted and, and impregnated, then that thing is definitely close enough to us genetically to be on the same branch of the tree. Yeah. Kissing cousins, so to speak. <laughs> not a cousin I'd want to kiss. You may not give you a choice. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Me, Bigfoot, we go to prom. <laughs> if it's okay. a good way, you lean in for a kiss and take your face off. Yeah. Yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I'm not doing... I lost again. Uh I don't Just think we're too far behind. Meg says that is very disturbing, extraordinarily mm -hmm. so for me. I just, that just beyond scary for me. Um, she says where I live now, uh, in past years, it is so quiet, your ears ring and you hear coyotes. Had them right behind my trailer one night. We get a lot of coyotes, or well, not here, but where I used to live on the farm, we used to have a big problem with coyotes. I, uh, used to in high school um, go out and shoot coyotes because there was a bounty on them by the Missouri Department of Conservation because they were killing livestock and you could get $10 for a set of ears. Uh, so I, you know, I did that quite a bit and local farmers were thrilled to death to have you come out there and because they were taking calves and killing, killing livestock, they, the population of the coyotes had just exploded. And it does every once in a while. They just have a banner year and they breed like crazy. And next, you know, we got coyote packs everywhere. And what people don't realize is if we don't keep predators like that under control, they will destroy our, our ecosystem. Uh, yeah. You can't let one or the other get out of balance uh, or it, it will, the, the, the havoc they reach, they reap, they reek will be unbelievable. Um, you know, it'll affect the meat industry. It'll affect crop growth. It'll affect everything. So, you know, you got to understand why people have to keep predators in check. Says I'm really glad that Cam connected his people with you guys. I'm looking forward to spending some time on your channel with his. Thank you again, DA. And nice meeting you, Neoma. Enjoyed my time here. Thank you. It was nice meeting you too. Thank you for joining us. We're happy to have you. And uh, the it's interesting, you know, people when somebody ever gets whenever somebody gets attacked by a shark, the first thing the fishermen do go, is they go out and um, they they fish the shark until there's none left on in the area, mm -hmm. and that that always disturbs the ecosystem. It's so important, especially with the keystone species or the apex predators, not to disturb the ecosystem because it will mess everything up all the way down the chain. Yes, it will. And, uh, there, there's a place for those predators. There's, you know, there's a reason they're that they're, they're part of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, you you can't get too many of them because then it affects everything beneath it in the food chain. Uh, same thing with deer. If the population of deer explodes, they will decimate crops. Mm -hmm. uh, and that happens all the time. I mean, that's why sometimes that, you know, they'll have what they call lottery years and for deer hunters where you'll get double the tags. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're like, there's a lot of them. Yeah, you know, go thin them out, boys. Um, they actually started issuing uh, bow licenses in town where I'm from in the parks in town 
they're super restricted areas, but you can go in there and hunt with a bow because they're so bad. Yeah, they did that here in Springfield a few years ago. Had yeah. limited hunts with very, very specific instructions for limited hunts here in Springfield because the, the deer population were just crazy. Yeah. Yep. Well, I I think we've covered it all tonight, don't you? I think we have. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's getting a little late and I still need to get some writing done. We're coming up on the three hour mark and we've had a, a lively chat and we've covered a lot of territory. And again, I'd like to say, I'd invite all of you out there, if you've got an idea for a show that you would like to see us do, uh, please contact me at daroberts at daroberts.net. Or you can contact me through Facebook. Uh, my, my Facebook author page is facebook.com slash daroberts.author. Um, you know, feel free to contact us if you got an idea for a show. And if it looks like something that we can get enough information on or know enough about, we'll be happy to do that. Um, and if you, again, if you've got an encounter you would like to tell us about, uh, contact me through DA Roberts at DA Roberts.net or through my Facebook, or you can even get me at Twitter at DA Roberts author. Uh, contact me on any of my social media because all my social medias are DA Roberts author. So it's easier to find me. Uh, just let us let us know if you've got an encounter you'd like to tell us. And if you just would like your encounter read on the air, you can email it to me or message it to me, and one of us will narrate it on the air. And um, I, I would love to hear your story. And if you'd like to, to join us and tell your story in person, we can make that happen as well. I um, want to thank all of you for joining us. It's been, a, been an awesome night. Naomi, you're a wonderful co-host. Oh, uh, thank you. You're we uh, we both... We both stumbled through this because neither of us know how to how to handle <laughs> uh, handle melon yet. But we're going to figure it out. It's it's going to get better. And uh, but, um, just real quick, um, I still don't know how to say the name right. Owissa wants to know what state your Springfield's in. Springfield, Missouri. Mm -hmm. I'm in the smack dab in the center of south uh, southwestern Missouri. Meg says enjoyed being here. Uh, what, Meg, we always enjoy. Um, Meg, you uh, you're always active in the chat. Shoot me a message sometime. I have a question I would like to ask you if you're if you'd uh, be interested. Uh, you can contact me through my Facebook or through da roberts at da roberts dot net. Uh, just just a question I'd like to ask you if you if you don't mind because you're always so active in the chat. Uh, so if you don't mind or if you're interested, just shoot me a message and I'll and I'll let you know. Um, Naomi, do you have something else? Uh, yeah, Laura Simmons says enjoy the show. Love listening to your stories. We'll check out some of da videos. Awesome. I hope you um, like them. Check out the Joe Bald videos, parts one and two. Um, yeah. There's 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 a lot of stuff in those videos. Um, I'm not going to bring up the rest. It's just um, Sal says goodnight. Oissa says thanks for doing this. It's been great. Um, uh, just people saying goodnight. So I think I, we're done. Bigfoot Anon says he's emailing you now. Awesome. Looking oh, forward cool. to checking that out. Um I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us tonight. You guys are awesome. Uh, I love the, love uh, the conversations we have. I love being able to talk about cryptids is my favorite subject to talk about. Ask anybody I've bored to tears at a party with uh, if cryptids is not my favorite subject to talk about. You know, like, oh, crap, it's Robert. He's going to talk about Bigfoot again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I love talking about Bigfoot. But I, well, I love and that's a good subject. It's one of my yeah. favorites, too. Bigfoot and dog, man, those are, what, what, what more do you need? That's right. uh, I, I love talking cryptids and I love enjoy, I, lo I thoroughly enjoy doing the show and it's a lot of fun and I get to talk to people from all over the world. I mean, we've had people from the Philippines, from Canada, from Europe, um, from Scotland specifically when, when Stephen chimes in and then we've had another, another guest come in from Scotland. It's always awesome to find, to hear what part of the, what, what part of the world you're from and find out that you're, you're joining us and spending some, some time with us. And it means the world to me that you guys spend time with us. And I want to thank every one of you from the bottom of my heart. It is awesome. Um, if you have not had the chance, please check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash DA Roberts author. You really can make a, make a difference in the DA universe. You'll have, you know, depending on which level you choose in the, in the Patreon community, you can help affect how the books are written, titles, uh, help choose covers. Uh, there will be short stories that aren't available anywhere else. I do a newsletter that's available through there. There will also be certain, uh, be uh, videos available there that aren't really available anywhere else. Uh, Josh is editing one now that's going to go up soon. Uh, then it will only be available to the Patreon. So, uh, you know, definitely 
you know, please check that out. And if you do do choose to become a member of the Patreon, that would be fantastic because the Patreon is for this. It's for helping do advertising for the books to help get equipment to where we can go shoot videos. It's helping bring shows like this where we talk about cryptids. It, it it's it's really a hundred percent for that. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that, that we can bring you guys a lot more. And I really look forward to going to some of these places and shooting videos to bring back for you guys so we can talk about LBL, so we can talk about the siege at Hanabi, so we can talk about the siege of Lockett Ranch. And one day I will be going to Port Jatham. That's going to happen. Don't know when, but it's going to happen. Um, and we just have a few more. Denise Snyder says, nice listening to you guys. Meg gave you her email address. Let me write Patty that says, down before it disappears. All right. Patty, Patty says, a pleasure like always. Um, oh, wait a minute. Meg says, Gmail says it is not legit. I know right. your email is. I will reply. Okay. Bigfoot Anon says, my buddy just shot a commercial at Port Chatham. Ooh, really? That would be awesome. Wissa says, lock and load for LBL, please. <laughs> yeah, we are going back to LBL sometime in October, and that's going to be a, that's going to be a hell of a trip. I'm gonna, we're going to spend more time there. Uh, we're going to shoot a lot more video, and um, may actually, if I can get the people involved in that are going back with me involved enough, we may spend the night in the north end of the end of the LBL and see what we can get on camera. I'm hoping to have a much better camera by that point. Um, so it's, it's, there's a lot coming in there and I want to keep bringing it. And uh, I appreciate you guys so much. Uh, I Patty, uh, Patty Meg, I got your email now. Uh, I'll shoot you an email here shortly. Uh, again, I want to thank every one of you for joining us and uh, and all the comments and all the all the love you guys have shown us. It's just a wonderful, wonderful experience to be have, be able to be here with you guys and talk about Bigfoot and everything else under the sun. And and it's just it's something I thoroughly enjoy doing, and I hope I I always get to do it. And it's it's I can see myself doing this long term. I would definitely love doing it. Um, I want to thank again. Thank you guys. Uh, I'm not going to play the outro because the video is not working because um, it, it basically just says thank you for joining us, which we've already said. And it says that you can check out all my works at daroberts.net. And if you have an encounter you would like to contact us, you can contact us at daroberts at daroberts.net. And again, thank you all. Naoma, thank you. You are, as always, awesome. Aww, thank you. Appreciate, appreciate you so much. You are the best. <laughs> and uh, we. So uh, are you. So uh, are you. I don't know about that, but <laughs> I'm okay. Uh, we were, well, again, we were planning on doing a Dixie Cryptid live event on Saturday, but Cam's unable to do it because of his work scheduling. So there will be a DAX mock in a Saturday night. I'll be scheduling a show sometime tonight or tomorrow. So you should get the notifications that it's been, that it's been scheduled. So hopefully you'll join us again Saturday night. And uh, thank you guys for joining us and thank you guys for being here. And I, I hope you, uh, hope you guys have a wonderful evening. And uh, if you're uh if you're going to go out in the woods looking for Bigfoot, take a Dark Angel medical kit and be careful. All right. Good God night. bless and good night. Guys, be safe.